Okay, um, please rise for the Star Spangled Banner. Thank you very much, Ms. Soward. <clears throat> Any town meeting members who have yet to be sworn in? Has everyone been sworn in? Are you ready for the test question? Our test question today, all right? We're going to take a test question with our clickers, make sure they're all turned on. <clears throat> our test question today is. I don't know where it is. <laughs> One minute. No, I can't do something that controversial. <laughs> well, we finished our meeting tonight. Vote one for yes, two for no, and as soon as we get our time, so go ahead and vote one for yes, two for no. These are the tester clickers. Make sure you received your yes or no received window. Have a quorum. No, well, we'll keep going while he plays over there with Mr. Harrington's clicker. Uh, I recognize the Board of Chairman, Mr. Greeley. Shh, Mr. Greeley has the floor, please. Quiet in the hall. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is moved in the unbelievable, unten untenable situation that if all of the business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, May 13, 2015, at 8 p.m. Do I have a second? All in favor, please say yes. yes. Opposed? No. Okay. Well, then, we're going to keep it down. Uh, any announcements or resolutions? Announcements or resolutions? Sir, you have an announcement or a resolution? Come forward. Hi, Kevin Koch, Precinct 16. Oh, Dave. Um, we all know that cancer is a, a horrible disease and it's rather indiscriminate in who it uh, affects. And uh, right now there are two uh, Arlington High School students who are battling cancer. And somewhat in response to that, the uh, Arlington High School Biology Club and Gibbs Committee are raising money, thank you Dave, for the Arlington's first Scoopermania, which will be this coming Saturday uh, from noon to 4 p.m. in front of the Cyrus Dallin Museum. Local ice cream stores and supermarkets will be donating the ice cream and toppings, and all proceeds will go to the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. It's going to be a great day to be out and about, so come on down to the center Saturday afternoon and enjoy some ice cream and support a worthy cause. Thank you very much, Shirts. Mr. McKinney? Just 
give your Lawrence announcement. Lawrence McKinney, uh, Seventh Precinct, Chairman of the Uncle Sam Committee, making a brief four minutes uh, report for our committee this year. Um, as you see, I stand before you with neither guitar, nor PowerPoint, nor just about anything at all. Well, it's back to exactly the shirt sleeves that I started with, you know, five years ago when our brave moderator put me in charge of this, at that time, moribund committee at a time when no one thought that Uncle Sam was anything more than a cartoon and no one really, really remembered that he existed. And that twin, five years ago when I stood here and we were being unvoted our $500, and you guys stood up and gave us our money. Elsie stood up, Dick stood up, Hugh McCrory stood up, and we were in business. This is, a, this is a town meeting committee. We were created by you people, not those people. Different, different, different. Okay, now the thing was, is we came back the next year, and what did we come back with? We came back with a button. We spent all year making sure that we weren't gonna be put out of the byway. No, man, we were not a cartoon. We wanna be part of the byway. Well, they didn't fund the byway, so the byway part of the tourism committee got lopped off for a couple of years, but we kept working. Oh, well, yes. We went on. We actually got work with this fine department here and got a light on that statue. And then we cleaned the place up. And then we did a little magic. And we changed the name of Memorial Park to Uncle Sam Plaza when nobody was looking. <laughs> the advocate keeps changing editors. They didn't notice. <laughs> At any rate, at this point, nobody's going to change it back because we actually got the Uncle Sam sign. We went to the Massachusetts Dish Cup Commission. Big, huge sign, both sides, bang, and it's there. And then we let Joe Curro open it up, even though I had to lend him my microphone and guitar amplifier. We got the darn thing opened up. We have, and now we have something even nicer, as Steve Jobs would say, and something extra. For the last two years, little Sam Wilson has been greeting Paul Revere as he comes through town. We have the only young patriot. Talk about tourism. We have something that nobody else has, and he's no longer, no longer just a cartoon figure in this town. So that's why I'm coming here to say, listen, we need more people for our committee. We go through them pretty fast. I'm really here to say thank you for all those who put up with me. Hugh McCrora, we have Bob, he was, he, you've been with us too. We had, oh, Elsie is still with us. We, uh, Brian, Carl, Wagner, Hugh. Um, we have had some of the best people come through and look what we did. We were unvoted. They made us one of the four major historic things. They took our sign away. I mean, Clarissa even sent the cops after us once. We have been through so much, but we are here because of you. And because of you, we're here because otherwise we wouldn't be here. You check through your town document, you will not find the words Uncle Sam, Uncle Sam Plaza, or Uncle Sam Committee once in the entire town planning document, which shows you about how much they love us. So you can ask them why we're not even part of the thing, but you are part of the thing, and I am part of the thing, and we need more committee members. So with that, we don't know what's coming next, but I want to drop my hat to the people who have helped us, the departments who have helped us, the friends who have put up with us, and uh, as Ted Peluso said, I'll never be appointed to the tourism committee because if they let me on, I'd make them do something. That having been said, uh, I think I probably am the Steve Jobs of committee members. I'm difficult to deal with, but we leave beautiful things behind. So thank you so much for helping us get this far, and let us hope we go forward into the future. This year again, Paul Revere came through, we had a good show, and again, thanks guys, and be welcome to join us in the next five years. Thanks guys. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chappett, did you have a report of the committee? No, an announcement or resolution, actually. We're on announcements and resolutions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Roland Chapman, Precinct 12. I have the honor of inviting you all to an event this weekend, and it's called Hidden Treasures. Very briefly, as you are aware, Arlington is one of 40 odd cities and towns in Middlesex County, and six little towns in southern New Hampshire that comprise Freedom's Way Historical Area. Now across the country, there are many Freedom's Way. Good example, for example, would be in Essex County on the North Shore, 
that's a Freedom's Way area. Ours is all of Middlesex County, so it starts way over in Malden and goes way out beyond Littleton. The directors of the Freedom's Way organization out in Devons decided that it would be nice if we have an opportunity to promote something in each community that's really special. And I was asked to work with Ed Gordon from the Schwann Mill to select one, and we selected the old Schwann Mill as our hidden treasure. Now, if you've never been there, it's a fascinating visit. That place has been making wooden oval mirror frames for over 100 years, and they still make them. Very fascinating. The equipment alone, if you're mechanically minded, is really fascinating. What Ed Gordon will do this coming weekend, any t anywhere between noon and three o'clock, make short presentations about the German influence that happens here in the greater Boston area because that's where the equipment originally came from. And he'll talk about 25 or 30 minutes and then you'll have an opportunity to see some of this equipment that works. Really very fascinating. So, noon to three o'clock, Saturday or Sunday, plenty of parking on Lowell Street, no cost. Hope to see you there, thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions? Seeing none, any reports of committees? Oh, go ahead. Jeff Boudreau, Precinct 21. Uh, Mr. Moderator, when I arrived early, I picked up my voting machine and uh, like Pavlov's dog, just sat down and uh, tried to vote when you had the test vote, it didn't work, so I assume. I found out that if you picked one up early, they were turned off. Normally they're turned on for us. So people might want to check to see if your uh, machines are on and turn them on. If I'm saying anything incorrect, the uh, technical people can assist, but uh, it's just a matter of pushing the on button. Okay, good. So does everybody have their machine turned on? M make sure it is on. Mr. McKinney, did you leave it on the stand? Don't lose it. And your glasses. Don't say anything. You're done. You had your four minutes. Go away. Any other reports of committees? Mr. Toss, uh, we never took three off the table, so we don't have to put it on the table. We never took it off. Move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Article 3 is on the table. That brings us back to Article. Everything's falling. Brings us back to Article 22. We are in the middle of the education budget. The next speaker on the list, I believe, was Mr. Jameson. We've got all sorts of stuff up here, Mr. Moderator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jamison, Precinct 12. Um, let's see, where was I? Oh, so first of all, um, I think we should be uh, extremely excited that um, the population of our school system is growing. And this is something that I, I've been a town meeting member for, this is my 12th uh, session, 12th year. And, and I've watched this town mature financially in a variety of other ways and become um, a place where um, we're getting a lot of people who want to move here. I was impressed by Ms. Brazil's comment that the Vision 2020 survey for the first time in many, many years had the highest number of percentage of residents were those who had been with us five years or less. So we've, we, together with the manager and the school system and the department heads, um, have created something that, that I think many people in the, the Commonwealth would be very envious of. So I, I want to uh, um, uh, compliment them on that. Um, my, next, my next thing I want to bring up, I want to um, echo some of the comments uh, related to the school budget in particular um, of Ms. LaCourt the other night. Um, there are two bodies that often provide long-term planning 
uh, input to the town, the long range planning committee, which has seen fit to, uh, by, with some discussion, I believe, with the school committee, I, I, I don't know the details of that, it, it, it decrease the rate of increase of their budgets um, de facto. Um, um, and the other uh, body that plays the game, and that is the Bud Budget Revenue Task Force, um, I would note that neither of those are codified in the town bylaws, but they are seem to be uh, being listened to as something that is going to tell us how we do our business going forward. I find that uh, inappropriate. Um, last, my last question was, the other question I had was addressed the other night, one of my questions, which was the large increase in budget line D in the school education budget as summarized in the FinCom report. And um, as we discussed the other night, that is the large increase is money that has been held aside to settle contracts going forward. This is no different than what we would have done in Article 20, which we'll get to uh, after we finish this article, where we would have put aside $700,000 uh, if we hadn't uh, apparently settled all the contracts. And we would have used those monies in future years on the floor of town meeting to vote those monies towards those future contract settlements, which we've done in many years prior. But back, back to this, uh, maybe we don't get everything we want and what do people really want from the services we provide. Uh, I would like to ask the school committee and perhaps the superintendent in particular through the moderator. Um, I, I read the, uh, their very nice voluminous report. I know the FinCon gets something like, like four times this size with all the details. Um, the, thing that struck, the other thing that struck my attention was there was $1.2 million of things that they wished they could have done this year. And I'd like to have some uh, granularity on what we're not getting because we don't have those funds. This is a recurring theme with, this, with all of our budgets, but uh, I know the manager struggles with this as well, but I'd like to have the superintendent perhaps or someone from the school committee address that uh, short, uh, briefly if they might, Mr. Moderator. Dr. Bode, can you give him a quick rendition of what your wish list was? How, how is this impacting our students on the ground and our teachers in the classroom? Should I start with impact or what, what types of things? If you want to look at page um, 26 in the book, you'll see what uh, we have identified close to a million dollars of um, a combination of personnel, uh, curriculum materials that we are, are not going to be able to fund next year. But I, I do want to say that this is actually a reduced list from the work that was done in the fall in, with all the administrators in the district um, about what they felt that we should have. So it was a process that even to come to this list. So what is not happening? We are going to have to defer curriculum materials uh, to outer years. We're not going to be able to have a another school nurse up at the Addison Middle School, which has one nurse for over 1,100 students. Uh, we're not going to be able to have um, a full-time teaching assistance in our kindergartens. We're going to not have more administrative support and, and FT in the uh, high school and more classroom teachers in the high school. You'll notice on this list there's a number of Point four is point two that that we are not going to be able to fund. So, um, am I correct to say that in some ways, as our class sizes by necessity um, redistricting aside, which I hope you're proceeding with, it's fully, class it's class sizes support for our classroom and, teachers. And that makes that makes let, managing. Let her finish. And, let her finish. It, it's support for our classroom teachers. It's uh, the the range of electives we can offer in the high school. Okay. And so this makes um, providing a full range of services more difficult. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. Ms. Brazil, you are next. Uh, Julie Brazil, Precinct 12. I think I have a follow-up question on that chart. Um, on page 26, um, there are a couple things that are um, 
a little concerning, and this is the one area that I got questions from uh, neighbors about before town meetings started. Um, specifically, the curriculum materials you mention, um, they're, they're designed, uh, it, it indicates they're STEM curricular materials in order to align with the Common Core. That doesn't feel um, like a luxury item. Um, can you speak a little bit to the impact on learning if we don't have updated curriculum? Dr. Bodhi? <clears throat> Kathleen Bodie, superintendent. Uh, we want to be able to, to update our elementary curriculum materials for science, mm -hmm. and we are putting this on a multi-year plan. So these materials are not funding uh, several of the grades in the elementary. We'll stagger this. Okay, so it's just we're slowing. Slowing it down. If we had had the money, we'd probably buy the materials for all the grades next year. Okay, and I'm gathering from looking at the list on page uh, 26 that that's sort of the trend all along. Things that you might have been able to do are being slowed. We, it's okay. slowed, and we, we pace it out uh, over several years, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Leonard? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope not to take up too much of your time. I would like to mention uh, last year, April 30th, there was a special town meeting. And you could possibly ask, well, what has that got to do with this year's budget? I hope to tie that in for you in an explanation. At that special town meeting, Article 6 appropriated $25,000, or 28000 excuse me. Uh, the town was asked to uh, come up with that money out of the transfer of funds from the uh, insurance fund to cover the damage that was done at the Pierce School with the water pipe breaking. When we inquired as to the uh, town manager <clears throat> as to why that should happen, he basically said it was our responsibility, but that not to worry because we have an insurance fund. When we inquired as to what, what the makings of the insurance fund was all about, Mr. Totsi of the Finance Committee explained there's $100,000 in that fund, and one of the principles of that fund, the reasons of that fund, is to basically cover situations such as the Pierce water pipe breaking. Later on in the year, there was an article of October in a town newspaper. The article basically stated that there was an unexpected surge in student enrollment, and the district was $838,000 over budget for the year 2014. A memo was sent at that particular time to the school committee notifying them the costs were fully covered by the return of special education reserves from town meeting, existing school department reserves, and emergency funding for the damage caused by the burst pipe at the Pierce School. I guess my first question, Mr. Moderator, is that if I'm to believe this newspaper article, it's telling me that insurance money was used to cover a budget deficit. Could I have an explanation on that, please? Mr. Tosti, can you address this? Any idea? Dr. Bodhi, you don't remember? Yeah. Mr. Chapterlane? Adam Chapterlane, town manager. 
Uh, if I had had prior opportunity to take a look at this news article or some of the details that Mr. Leonard had raised, I'd be happy to try to find an answer and an explanation working with the CFO of the school department, but I haven't had any opportunity to review this question or any of these materials. This article, as I say, was in full view of anybody with the archaic system of a newspaper, which I read, and it was dated October 16th, 2014. It leads one to believe, Mr. Moderator, that insurance money, as I said earlier, was used to cover damage caused, or was used to cover a deficit in the budget. My, que my second question would be that if this was allowed, and if the 28,000 that was transferred if it, it was more than enough to cover the damage that was done, why wasn't that money returned to the insurance fund? If, in other words, if, if the Pierce damage was less than 28,000, that money should have been returned to the insurance fund. Lastly, Mr. Moderator, as you can see by Tom Meeting book, which I gave you, yep. as I read this and did some research, Anything involving budgets, without exception, being the school committee also, any change, any existing funds has to come before town meeting. Now, one could say, well, if this notice that you're looking at, Mr. Leonard, occurred in October, there's no town meeting. There was no special town meeting. My comment to that would be, Mr. Moderator, that depending on the amount of money that was used from the insurance money to cover the damage, could something else have taken the place to cover the budget deficit until such time as the next town meeting convened? Can you address that, Mr. Tosti? I, I'm not sure if this is what you've been talking about but last year at the special town meeting, uh, the town meeting transferred $25,863 from the building, municipal buildings insurance fund to fund repairs because of a system malfunction uh, at the Pierce School. Exactly. Okay, well that wasn't a deficit. There was a problem with the, uh, um, the heating system malfunction resulted in frozen bursting pipes. Excuse me, Mr. Tarsi, no, what it was was <clears throat> that money went to fix the problem with the pipes. I agree with you. This article, which, um, you know, I was able to dig out of the newspaper, states that emergency funding for the damage caused by the burst pipe at the Pierce School, some of that money went to help for the budget deficit that was incurred by the school committee in 2014. And my question is, when is insurance money, why is insurance money, as I read this article, being used to cover anybody's budget deficit? Mr. Chaplain. Adam Chaplain, town manager. I think I understand more clearly what Mr. Leonard is getting at. That money was appropriated because the school department had to expend unexpected funds to fix the issues at the Pierce School based on the burst water pipe. So with town meeting's appropriation of the $25,000 last spring, that reimbursed what would have been a deficit or a shortfall in the school department. So I, I think that's what you're getting at. Is it a practice, lastly, is it a practice that at a, a whim, let's say, Insurance money can be used for whatever particular pur purpose that they want? I'll allow him, I'll allow him to answer the question. I, I don't believe that is what you're stating happened. Uh, again, I, I, my, my understanding of from, from what you're saying is that a deficit that was caused by the damages no. was then covered by the transfer approved by town no. meeting. The deficit was caused by an unexpected surge okay. in student enrollment. Well, Mr. T um, Leonard, I understand your position that you were look like looking for an answer, but this is the kind of question that if Dr. Bodie, Mr. Tosti, and Mr. Chapdelaine had been pre-approved of, they'd have an answer for you. 
Maybe they can try and find something at the break and advise you afterwards, but I don't think we're going to get to the bottom of your question today. In closing, Mr. Moderator, the only reason I brought it up is in the town meeting is because, as you can see by the town meeting time, it states anything I, changing on a budget in a town board has to come before town meeting, and I figured it would be appropriate for town meeting to hear this because they are the ones that, that vote on the budget. Thank, Thank you. you. Wait, get your town meeting time. Do you have a further answer for him, Mr. Tatosti? Yes. Uh, the, the article that I mentioned, uh, the sum of 25, this was uh, approved by town meeting at the special town meeting in April, on April 30th, 2014. The sum of 25863 transferred from the building, municipal building insurance fund, which covers deductibles from our insurance, uh, to fund repairs, replacements, to heating system malfunction on January 14, 2014, which resulted in frozen bursting pipes at the Pierce Elementary School, said sum to be expended under the direction of the town manager. So this money did not go to the school system. It went to the manager to fund this repair. Thank you. Ms. Seuss, you are next. Hi, uh, Jennifer Seuss, Precinct 3, and also a member of the school committee. Um, about the previous speaker, I don't have an answer, but I think that Adam Chaplin's um, answer is probably on target, that there are a bunch of reasons, and that maybe it was maybe a uh, poorly or loosely worded um, editor um, article in the paper that maybe caused the confusion, is, is my guess. Okay, to my marks. Um, I want to talk briefly about the financial stressors on our school system, uh, some of which you know. There are basically two stressors that are happening right now. One is coming from the state and federal government, and one is coming from our increasing enrollment, which, of which we are a victim of our own success. We have a great school system, and people want to move here. For the first stressor, there's sort of two parts of it. Um, one is that the state keeps um, nickel and diming us, taking away little bits of money, so METCO is going to get cut 7% next year. The kindergarten grant, which is a quarter of a million dollars, is going to get cut by 22% next year and will probably be eliminated the year afterwards. Uh, Charlie Baker is just sort of philosophically opposed to the kindergarten grant. Um, <laughs> And um, the second part of sort of the state and federal uh, financial stressors are what are known as sort of unfunded mandates. So in the last few years, um, we've had a bunch of mandates. These are mandates, they're not optional. Um, one is a new teacher evaluation, Common Core. We have sort of a refocus and retraining of teachers uh, to deal with um, English language learners. We have a potentially a new evaluation system in which we have to have new technology, new training to handle that. And um, some of these things are very good, but none of them are paid for by anyone but us, right? We don't get any extra money for them. So that adds an extra financial stressor on us. Uh, for the other sort of bucket of financial stressors, which is the increasing enrollment, um, as many of you people have pointed out, we've had a 450 student surge in the last three years. That's an entire elementary school. That is 9.1% growth. That enrollment is not a bulge. <laughs> that is not, you know, we are going to continue to grow at this rate. We are seeing birth numbers that are very high. Um, we are seeing toddlers <laughs> everywhere. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, in East Arlington, I, I say I can't sort of walk two feet without tripping over a toddler. Of course I don't. I'm, I'm very careful. But, <laughs> but there's toddlers everywhere. So we, this is not going to go away. Um, and to put another sort of take on it, you might have heard, um, our current high school class is about 300. Our current kindergarten class is 500. And the kids born is 600 <laughs> last year. So, so we are going to see a big surge. Now, a couple of years ago, um, a bunch of people in town got together and worked very collaboratively to come up with a partial solution to this problem. So this was like FinCom, the school committee, the town manager's office, um, that gave us this sort of extra enrollment growth, you know, extra amount. 
what they decided on was 25% of Arlington's per pupil enrollment was going to be given to us the, the next year. So if we have an extra 150 people coming this year, you know, next year we get the money for that. So it allows us to sort of not you know, fall off a cliff each year. Um, but I actually want to point out something to uh, Ms. LaCourt's sort of picture that she's been talking about. That 25% number was created sort of, it was a box that was created sort of out of thin air. So it wasn't, we didn't do an analysis and say, what is the marginal cost of adding an additional student to the Arlington Public Schools? Um, we just said, you know, 25% seems like a good number, seems like something we could all live with, and let's come up with that. And I think one of the things that we're finding is that may not be enough. Um, we don't know exactly how much is enough, and we have to do a lot of analysis to find that out. It's an incredibly complicated thing. But I have to say that we, even with the incredible generosity of the town, um, we are going to lose ground year after year. As you, as you know, as I know that you guys know, we, um, our education is, about, is funded about 10% less than the state average, actually 11% less than the state average. So the state average is 14,021. We are at 12,546. We are also lower than the town measure 12 communities. These are the sort of semi-comparable communities that we compare ourselves to. So we're at a very, very razor thin budget. And when we lose ground, it's sort of really bad for us. <laughs> so I just want to sort of fill people in. So given these incredible stressors, of which we don't really have a lot of control over, it is particularly upsetting that the, we sort of have decided to cut our rate of growth to 3% over the next couple of years. Now, by itself, cutting the rate to 3% doesn't sort of severely affect us. But you put that with the fact that the enrollment is increasing and it's not totally covered, plus the unfunded mandates, plus the chipping away at, at things from the state, and it, it, it's leading to, down the road, potentially a very dire situation. Um, I just want to say, though, I mean, I, Arlington's finances are very tight for structural reasons. I have a tremendous respect for the people who are intricately involved in the town finances, the capital planning committee, the finance committee, the town manager's office. They've been very careful with our money, and this is a very, very good thing. We have a AAA bond rating. We have sufficient reserves. We don't do extraneous spending. This is a great thing. They look for ways to save the town money. We have solar panels on the roof, or we will. Um, but, but to the extent that Arlington voters have been given a choice, so take your typical person who's moved to Arlington in the last 10 years, 60% of people have moved to Arlington in the last 15 years. 60% of the adults living in Arlington today have moved here in the last 15 years. Um, take your typical person who's moved here 10 years ago, to the extent that they've had any chance to vote at all, they've consistently voted for overrides or for even to increase something. So the last two overrides, both went over 50%. We have 52%, 53%. We have the CPA that was voted at 54%. And for those last two things, we didn't just vote to maintain our services, we voted to sort of increase them slightly. So it may be that if you ask the voters again, they will say, no, 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 I'd rather have small, modest cuts. You know, I, the taxes, I'm just at my limit. Taxes can't go up. But to again echo Ms. LaCourt's point, we haven't really asked them yet. And I'd like, That's I urge you to do so. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Stephen Harrington. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13, and one of the lonely 46%. Um, budgets to me on about, you know, priorities or um, or my, my goals in life. Budgets are just financial management. And so, um, you know, I'm a numbers guy, and I look at the, um, the budget, which previous speakers on the other night pointed out that the education budget, um, the subsection D, went up 79%. And I'm certain that we all understand why. It's $2 million if you look on B13 of the finance book. And if you look in the um, school committee, uh, the school department, on page 34, you'll see the two million to system-wide accounts. And um, Mr. Moderator, correct me if I'm wrong, we heard that that's strictly for um, negotiations that are ongoing with uh, various unions, and I 
just to be fair, let's say it's all of the um, um, employees and the payroll in the uh, school department. So um, the question I have, though, is what is the total salary in the school department currently? We look at a $53 million budget here. What's the total salary, roughly within a million dollars? Mr. Moderator, do you know? I'm deciding if I should ask Ms. Johnson or Dr. Bodie. I just want a number, you know, I think it's like 40 Ms. million, give or take, a million. Ms. Johnson, do you have that answer? So I guess it's about 40 million. And so who here can do 2 million divided by 40? Here you go, she's gonna tell you. Diane Johnson, Chief Financial Officer for the School Department. I regret to say that my, my intrinsic mathematics skills don't allow me to run up this uh, row of sums in my, in my head, but if you look on page 40, um, the first several lines, 8111 administrative salary, 8112 teacher salary, 8113 custodial salary, 8114 food services salary, 8115 clerical salary, 8116 full-time teacher aid salaries, 8117 other full-time salaries, 8118 part-time salaries, and then if you skip down to um, 81304 maintenance salaries, those are the categories that comprise our payroll. Thank you. I think it's um, horrible that you don't know what your payroll is. I'm sorry. Uh, I think it's $40 million. So $2 million and $40 million is 5%. So what we have put aside, we're budgeting a 5% increase in payroll for next year. There's no question, it's absolutely the, a number. So the question becomes, why are we budgeting 5% increase in the payroll for next year? If you look at what the town side did, it was 2.75% or 2.5%. And so 5% is a lot to budget. This isn't what we're spending, this is what we're budgeting. Yes, now the problem is, is several problems. If you look back at the Finance Committee report and you look at the school department budget, it's gone up 23% in the last four years, five, six percent a year. It's the single largest budget. If you look at the pension budget, which we'll talk about in a little bit, it's gone up five or six percent a year. If you look at the insurance budget, it's going up like six percent this year. The four biggest budgets in the town accounting for 70% of all the expenses are going up at five to six percent a year. That's not sustainable even with overrides. It's just not sustainable. By taking two million dollars for a five percent salary increase, what you're ending up with is actually a million dollars more than you actually need. And that million dollars is then compounded going forward. So next year, when we raise the school department budget, whatever it is, that million dollars included. And included in that is, we won't know where that million dollars go. If they wanted to fund the million dollars on page 26 that they wanted to, I'd be all for it. If they said, hey, we want to create a lab, I'd be all for it. But budgets should have what you're gonna spend the money on, and they're not spending it on a 5% salary increase. I think she's gonna tell you what Well, the I'm not, that's not a question. Well, you asked a question. You said, what's the extra money the five percent. No, no, I didn't ask a question. Can I just finish? Because I'm almost done with my time. All right, he doesn't want to find out what the answer is. No, they had the chance. I gave him a chance. It's not hard to. You should know your payroll. I mean, that's not. You know, that's not a question that you should ask in advance. He's, he doesn't want an answer so to I his question. So I want to ask a. Uh, I'd like to make a motion, Mr. Moderator. I'd like to change the school department budget. I'd like to take that million dollars. Hey, hey, hey. And I'd like to put it back into the reserves. And I'd like to, if they need the money because salaries negotiated at 5%, then by all means, come back, we'll give it to you. But I think it's really important that this town meeting look at a budget and say, this is just financial management. And we need to provide good financial management. So Mr. Moderator, I'd like to make a, an amendment to the budget and change 
Budget 21 from 53 million to 52 million and change. Have a have, second, please. Do you have that in writing? I do. Why do we have it the other night? So now, I want you to think about this clearly. If you don't know what your payroll is, you lose a lot of credibility. If you don't know what you want to spend the money on, we shouldn't budget it. We shouldn't budget a 5% increase in payroll. That's what this $2 million is on $40 million salary. You shouldn't put it into a budget that gets compounded year after year. And um, I don't care how many overrides you have, you can't sustain 70% of your budget between four categories increasing at 5 6% a year. Thank you. Cardin. Mr. Cardin. Uh, Len Cardin, Precinct 20. Uh, I have some remarks, but before I get to what I was going to say, um, let me ask uh, the question as to whether there is an explanation of the amount set aside in the school budget for salary increases. I'm sorry, so Ms. Johnson's going to answer that question. Um, Diane Johnson, Chief Financial Officer. Um, thank you for asking that question, Mr. Cardin. Um, also included in that amount of money isn't just salary increases, but it's the steps and lanes that the teachers that are already employed as they go up through the ranks. So this is all of the funding that we use to, to fund the salaries in the upcoming year. So there may be a percentage increase on top, but the steps and lanes are built into a way our contracts are done with the teachers. And that represents about $650,000 of that $2 million. Okay. So Thank if you, you wanted to calculate the percentage of payroll, I think I, I apologize that I wasn't able to answer the entire question um, in terms of total payroll because we're in negotiations and I'm thinking about it bargaining unit by bargaining unit, and that's how it appears in the budget because they're not always the same percentage from bargaining unit to bargaining unit. Does Thank that you. help? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so I... Um, I wanted to talk more about, um, we've already had a couple of speakers on this, but I wanted to talk more about the context of um, Ms. LaCourt's comments uh, about the master plan and, uh, and what we want to spend as a town, specifically in the context of education. Um, we've, we've, again, we've heard some about it. I, I do have a chart here which um, shows the numbers that Ms. Seuss was talking about. This, the, that's, this is uh, state data, and it shows the uh, per pupil spending, both by the state average and the town of Arlington. And as you can see, uh, as compared to earlier in the decade, the last decade, um, 2006 and 2007, uh, we began to fall behind, and now we're, we're quite seriously behind. Uh, and, and, you know, we can talk a lot about the formula. You know, there's this formula for special education growth, and we talked a lot about that at Finance Committee. We actually had a similar proposal at Finance Committee to reduce the budget by one million. We have um, this formula, this growth rate of 25% of, of the per pupil costs to get to enrollment factor. We have the 3% or is it 3.5% growth rates. We have all these formulas and we're trying to budget by formula and sometimes we lose sight of what we really need. So I'm, I think we're having a good conversation. What I'd really like to see next year is I'd like to see uh, in a, an alternative budget come forward from, this, from the school department one that does meet the master plan numbers, and one that, that gives us an opportunity to perhaps fund some of the things that the school department feels is necessary that can't fit in under the plan. The plan that we had before the voters was a three-year plan. We, for three years, had to fit under that plan because we promised the voters. That was two years ago. This budget we're voting on tonight is two years past the master plan. So we can make adjustments and, and I hope next year we'll have a serious conversation about what we as a town want for our school department, what we can do to close this gap, and uh, how we're going to move forward. Uh, just, you know, a little bit more on why we're falling behind. You know, we have to remember that the override did not restore everything that was cut from the school department budget. There were funding shortages leading up to 2012, and we only put back 600,000. We also had school growth of 150 kids that before we even started take, paying attention to it. 
So we had another 150 kids come into town earlier in the decade. And as we already heard about, the enrollment growth factor is only a quarter of the total expenditures uh, based on this. And then finally, the, the enrollment growth factor also comes after a year. It comes a year later. So we're a year behind in funding. We're just putting funding in next year's budget for the 170 kids extra that we have this year. So that is also contributing to the problem because we're funding it a year late. So you know, to, to get back on track with the state, to get back to where we were at, at about 96% of average, would cost $4 million a year, and nobody's asking for that. But I do think next year we have to take a serious look at what we want to do with our school budget going forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hanner. Bill Hainer, Precinct 2. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I just want to make it clear uh, to the town meeting that any cut in the school budget cannot be specifically directed to any one item. Once the budget is passed, at whatever number it is passed, it is at the discretion of the school committee and the school department on how that money is spent. So a cut of $1 million does not guarantee it be put somewhere or uh, in a reserve or it has an effect on salaries. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Tosti, you were next. Al, you had your hand up? Oh. Mr. Moore? No? This is from the other day. Mr. Schlickman? Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. Let me explain to you some of the uh, facts, of the way school budgets are done in Massachusetts. It isn't just us, this is the whole state. The funding for the current school year, the one that we're living in right now, is based on the number of students who were enrolled on October 1st, 2013, when we had 5,020 students. The foundation budget, is calculated based on that enrollment. The Chapter 70 aid is derived from the foundation budget. On October 1 of 2014, we had 5,208 students. It's a 3.7% increase over one prior year, and 188 students who were in our schools who were not covered by the foundation budget in the Chapter 78 calculations. But we need to educate them. And as we sat in school committee meetings last June and in September, we were scrambling to use every resource we had to provide the additional teachers we could afford to fund to meet this significant increase in the number of students. We will open school in September based on the 5,208 students in the budget and the foundation that were counted on October 1, 2014. We know we're going to get more. The addition of students is a stress. And think about 188 students. That's mm, about 12 teachers you need to cover those 188 students. And if you're thinking about our salaries going up 5%, we're, we're, we've got an increase in 3.7% of student enrollment over a year. We need to hire more teachers to maintain class sizes. And that's one of the things that we promised the people of Arlington when we went for the last override. We will manage our resources wisely. We will put money in reserve. We will parcel them out parsimoniously, but our goal is not to run amok with spending, but our goal is to maintain the services that people had because people who were in favor of the override wanted to maintain the current level of services we have, and we are struggling to do that because of the immense pressure of uh, being a very popular town. Now, we, we don't have additional streets that we need to pave. 
We don't have additional uh, miles of streets, additional water customers. We don't have a lot of additional things going on in the town side. But a 3.7% increase in students, that's significant, and we've got to figure out what to do with it. We've got to figure out how to manage our space. We're going to need to do portable classrooms, which are expensive. We're going to have to hire more teachers, and that's just to uh, maintain the status quo. This is not new programs, this is not new technology, this is not new initiatives. It's just trying to provide next year's kids with the services we were providing last year. The other thing that I'd want to point out is for special education costs, because that, that certainly was an element of controversy. Um, back in fiscal 2009, we had 69 very high cost students. Last year, fiscal 14, we had 81. The average expenditure for those 81 students was about $75,000 a piece. A couple of them move into town or turn three years old. That's a big hit on the school budget that can come all at once if they walk in the door in September and say, okay, here's my kid, you have to educate them. That's why we had the stabilization fund. 2012, we put $500,000 in that fund. Last year, we needed it and we took it back out. This year, we're going to drop $200,000 into free cash, which will replenish the stabilization fund for next year. This is a high-cost item, and the state is not a particularly good player on this. Uh, they will reimburse us for part of it, but the first $40,000 is exempt from state reimbursement. The state is told to reimburse us at 75%, subject to appropriations by the legislature. This year we got 72. Back in fiscal 2009, we got 42.34%. So the state didn't make their obligation. And the reimbursements for last year come in four equal amounts with that last $400,000 payment coming on June 30th of this year. It's not easy maintaining services in, in a system where you've got increasing special ed costs just because of the nature of the beast, every district in the state has this, and really sharp increases in enrollment. I urge you to soundly defeat Mr. Harrington's amendment and then understand the needs of our children are beyond a formula because the enrollments are beyond a formula. The needs for contemporary education are beyond a formula. And I thank the people who are getting up and asking for a discussion on these topics because yes, this is the most important service we're providing the town. It makes us who we are. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Please. Mr. Fuller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Peter Fuller, Precinct 20, uh, back to nuts and bolts. In the Finance Committee report on the Education Budget Line E, operations slash maintenance programs, shows a substantial decrease for the second year in a row, down 8.4%. So my question is, why the decrease? What are we not doing, or what are we doing more efficiently? Ms. Johnson. Diane Johnson, Chief Financial Officer for the School Department. Um, one of the things that's misleading about the report you see from the Finance Committee is that it represents only a portion of the total school committee budget. And so that is a piece of what we're planning to do, it's not all of what we're doing. And so to draw conclusions about the fact we're spending more or less on maintenance or anything is, is not really accurate. Um, I think the better place to look would be in our books at what we've been doing on maintenance. And we have realized some energy savings. Um, we've, you know, through the Green Communities grants, we've increased some efficiencies throughout our buildings. Um, we've done a really exciting program at the Pierce School that allows us to detect faults in our heating systems and repair them ahead of time. And so all of that is allowing us to spend less. Um, if we look at page 34, um, facility 75, 
I think you can see that facilities all in has, um, we're projecting lower, but our budget for next year is still quite strong. Hey, thank you, I'm reassured though, still a bit confused, but that's the way it is. Um, second question, in the school budget book on page 17, it says, the school department is funding one half the cost of a new facilities director and administrator with the town funding the other half. And on page 23, it shows us 60,000 for the director, 30,000 for the administrator. But if you look at the town's facilities budget that we talked about the other night, they have their half of the director, but the administrator is not mentioned. So what's going on here? Ed? Do the school department, your half of the administrator? Who are you asking? Oh, Mr. Chapdelaine, the town's half? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, in regards to an administrative function for the proposed facilities department, which we discussed uh, last week, uh, the actual staffing, whether it not be from within existing staffing that's handling that administration or potentially through the need of a new position, is a detail that between myself and the superintendent still needs to be worked out. Working on the jigsaw puzzle, okay. That's a good um, description. Going, going forward, if positions presently funded in the school department are moved into the facilities department, is it anticipated the increase in the school budget going forward would be reduced by the cost of those positions? Adam Chaplin, town manager. I, I think the way I would answer is that we'll be sure that there's a fair share between the town and the school department. Fair enough, thank you. Thank you, sir. The Valeri. Oh, there he is. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bob Valeri, precinct one. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Tosti, Mr. Dice, and uh, for their uh, comments the other night in their uh, advocacy for the protecting the taxpayer. And also, uh, in previous meetings, uh, Mr. Greeley and Mr. Chapdelaine also said the same thing. So uh, as a taxpayer of the town, I thank them for that. Um, in the education budget, item B, in the Finance Committee's report, we already did uh, hear that 7% um, per year is budgeted for special education increase. And um, the change from last year was actually 1.08%. So my question is, um, is there a way or um, some type of a method that we can take the extra that's budgeted for the special education budget and put it into a reserve fund? Because as we just heard, um, we can get big increases in that budget unexpectedly from year to year, depending on the needs of uh, particular students. So is there someone that can answer? Mr. Tosti's gonna answer that. Uh, yes, I made that recommendation to the superintendent uh, that we, we keep the special ed at, at the 7%. Uh, and then if it doesn't go to 7%, let's say it's gonna go up 4%, you fund the extra 3% with a reserve, and uh, the superintendent seemed to think that was a good idea, so I think maybe we'll see something like that in the future uh, next year, but obviously we don't see it now. Uh, you'll see an amount uh, set aside in the, in the town's reserve fund in a couple of budgets uh, where a certain amount of money is, is, uh, will be set aside for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Ms. LaCourt. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15. Um, so if you look in the school committee's uh, report to town meeting, on page 19, you will see that there are several pages of goals and strategic initiatives. So my first question is, are those strategic initiatives intended to be accomplished in one year or are they multi-year initiatives? Dr. Bodie. Kathleen Bodie, Superintendent. Some of the goals are aspirational. 
and many of them are uh, intended to be accomplished in one year. So in, in a couple of cases, they'll be continued into next year. I could give you specifics on, on those. Um, no, that answers the question. Um, so my follow-up question is simply to point out that you then have a couple of pages, pages 24 and 25, that seem to tie particular line items in the budget to particular strategic initiatives. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Mr. Court, address your questions to the chair. Sorry, sir. You, um, the, the, sorry. Okay. So um, the question that I have then is, given that we are setting the growth rate in the general fund contribution to the school budget at 3.5% this year, theoretically 3.25% next year, and 3% every year thereafter, do we have a set of strategic initiatives under these goals for years, FY17, 18, 19, 20, and 21, and have we done the financial analysis to know that we can meet those goals with that rate of increase in the general fund contribution to the school budget. Dr. Bodie, have such a study's been conducted? That's a long answer. Um, let, me take, let me just take one of the goals, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two goals under goal one. One has to do with achieving uh, a PPI score of mm -hmm. 75 and, a, and, mm -hmm. a, and a, a, a growth factor of uh, 50, 51. Now, in order for Mm -hmm. us to be able to accomplish these goals, we need to be able to provide mm -hmm. all of the instruction support, differentiated instruction for students that are not achieving at that level. And I think that one of the things we have talked about in this graphs mm -hmm. here in the, uh, mm -hmm. in the book it, that talks, ab that, that demonstrates that one of the things we've been investing in in the last few years is, is the, those interventions. But they are, as you talked, as we talked about before, planned out over multiple years because we can't do everything at once. For example, mm -hmm. we can't have a math coach at every elementary mm -hmm. school. We cannot have a literacy coach at el every elementary school. So we plan how we're going to be able to meet those needs for supporting students um, in a sort of a measured strategic way. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were to provide these kinds of supports, I think we would see a surge right away. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly did when we, we hired math coaches at the elementary, we saw an immediate change in math scores for elementary mm -hmm. students. And I'm talking about elementary, but we can also take that same kind of analysis to our middle school mm -hmm. and to our high school. We, we have these goals, and those are two that are, uh, mm -hmm. the, that are uh, aspirational. We certainly meet those with respect to all our aggregate of our students, mm -hmm. and, but we do not necessarily meet them with all of our students that, um, that are need additional right. support. Right, but I guess the question that I'm asking is, given that we're making a decision about the overall general fund contribution to the school budget that sounds like it's intended to be a five-year decision, have we done five-year planning to know whether or not those numbers will match the needs of the students and the growth in our enrollment and so on and so forth. And it sounds to me like what you're saying is that we have not done that long-term planning exercise and that that decision is being taken not in light of that information. In other words, we haven't... Dr. Bodie, do you have a five-year plan? I'm sorry, pardon? I think she's asking if you have a five-year plan in a study to back yes. it up. Well, we have a, certainly a five-year financial plan. We also have, um, it's, we don't have a plan right now for when we're going to be able to, to do all of the curriculum additions we need. Right. Um, we certainly have a multi-year plan for technology. Um, we have a plan for um, basically looking at how we're going to maintain enrollment levels. Uh -huh. And that is the first priority. We are going to hire a teacher over um, hiring support personnel. Um, we are going to hire a teacher over paying for curriculum materials because 
that, that is probably the single most important investment as we move forward. Right. So are you telling me that you have a strategic plan that validates 3.5% this year, 3.25% next year, and 3% in each of the following years of an increase in the general fund portion of the school budget? A strategic plan question? financially, yes, and we, we have a we have a we do have a multi-year plan financially. Now, tied will to these that goals plan, wait, 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 Miss Lacourt, let her answer. You can't interrupt. Will that plan meet all of our enrollment growth needs? That remains to be seen because we don't we we've done our own projections on enrollment. We're we're doing a, a study right now to to verify mm -hmm. those. But should those enrollment increases exceed mm -hmm. what we're expecting right now, that is going to change our, our financial plan. Because again, the priority will be toward teachers, um, and that will eat a larger portion of our budget. So let me ask the question one more way, if the moderator will tolerate. Does your strategic and financial plan support the reductions in the general fund allocation to the schools that the Finance Committee is talking about doing yeah. without reducing the quality of our education plan. Be a quick answer. Larry? Time is up, but a very quick answer. Our financial plan does incorporate the reductions, but it will also mean there's going to be a reduction in services. Um, and a reduction across the board, and it will not be a particular program. It'll be spread out and a number of um, a number of initiatives. I think the Thank I you. think the key words Time, here are up. reduction Time's in up. services. Times up. I let it go over already. Sean Harrington. One way in the back on the right. Yep. Uh, good evening, Linda Hansen, Precinct 7. Um, also a 23-year educator. The last 15 years of those have been in Arlington. And I'm also currently the president of the Arlington Education That's Association. Nice. So I just want to say that as I've been listening to speakers throughout town meetings so far, I've really appreciated those that have tried to pull the conversation back a little bit to help us see the bigger picture under discussion. So I'm going to try and do that uh, with my remarks. Over the past four years, I think that the Long Range Planning Committee has worked effectively with the town manager and the school committee to create stability in our budgets, and that's a good thing. The same committee has also kept the needs of the future school buildings front and center, namely the Stratton, the high school, and the Minuteman. That's also an incredibly important thing. With the help of the savings from moving the employees to the GIC, the conservative budgeting estimates, and a recovering economy it's led to a tripling or slightly better of the number of years that this override um, should be expected to last. As has been discussed already, Arlington runs a very lean and mean town budget. We spend less than the state average in terms of per, per, per pupil expenditures. We also spend less than the average per pupil expenditures for our most comparable communities based on a comprehensive salary study. Ms. LaCourte has referred in her remarks the other night to the competing pressures that shape our school and town budget. The financial pressures of keeping taxes low for the, for the taxpayers and the trade-off between that and growing our programs and supports in the town. I would like to add to that a third pressure, which is lifting our wages for employees to the average of our most comparable communities. We are also below the average in this vein as well. So just as the town was asked to vote in 2011 to raise the 2.5% cap, I really do feel like there should be a wider conversation about the teaching and learning environment in the schools, as well as the supports for other town services. A wider conversation about what we spend, what we get for it, and what our aspirations are for the town we live in. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. McCabe. I'm Mark McCabe, Precinct 2. 
I stand to terminate debate on the school budget, budget number 21 and all matters before it. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate on uh, school budget 21 and all the matters before it. Um, you ready? Requires a two third vote. No, we're just terminating debate. Okay, move, motion to terminate debate on Article 21 and the amendment before it. All in favor, please say yes. All opposed, say no. Clocks. Well, vote. One is yes, two is no. Okay, break, break my chops. Everybody knows we press one for yes and two for no. Did, well, 204 people figured it out. 206. Hundred third, 175 in the affirmative, 27 in the negative. Debate is terminated on Article Budget 21. That brings us to Budget 22, libraries. Who wanted to discuss libraries? Budget, we terminated debate. We're not going to vote on We'll do the amendment when we vote everything. It's consent budget. Libraries. Ms. Seuss? Yeah, someone did. I have a hold on library. Yeah, I got a hold on libraries. Jennifer Seuss, Precinct 3. I'm not going to be that long this time. Um, I just wanted to give some information that uh, several friends of mine who are Friends of the Fox supporter members, um, they uh, support the Fox Library's mission, including paying for Friday hours. Uh, they have a bunch of money that they're dying to spend. They really want to spend. This is not taxpayer money. This is privately raised money because of the success of the Little Fox and because of some really generous donors who really support the Fox Library. Um, and the two things that they want to accomplish, and this is not them, this is coming from the community, are that they would like to add Saturday hours and they'd like to do a big renovation of the space, including potentially adding an elevator if they can afford it to make it um, ADA compliant. So this is private money that they want to spend, not taxpayer money. And it's just, there's been a whole bunch of logistical hurdles. One of the main problems is that we don't currently have a library director. Um, and I just want to say that I hope everything gets worked out and that people are happy about it. That's it. Anyone else wish to discuss libraries? Seeing none. Um, health and Human Services 23, someone put hold. Who wants to discuss Health and Human Services? Ms. Mamone. I got a, I, Al, I got a hold. Serena Memon, Precinct 21. So I just wanted some clarifications. Um, on this health comp officer, I guess there's a 13% raise on, um, on the health comp officer under details of personnel services? Is that, that makes, I mean, that seems like a huge raise. Is that correct? Um, Mr. Chapdelaine? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. That particular position was reclassified last year by town meeting, so then the budget uh, is included in the article in 2015, but then takes the place of the budget in 2016. So that, again, was a reclassification. Okay, and then also there's some expenses that went up by 25%. Um, what's going on there between 25, 2015 and 2015? Mr. Chapley? Adam Chapdelaine, town manager, are you uh, pointing out veterans aid and assistance? No, I'm looking at the second line. It says personnel. First, health, 23, health and human services, all health and human services, personnel, personnel services and expenses. So, so that's a summation of all of the health and human services line items, and the, the major cost increase in expenses is in that veterans aid where am I? Uh, I understand. Veterans Aid and Assistance. And, and that, that is solely based on an increase in the caseload of eligible veterans served by our Veterans okay. Department. So that's okay. And then what about the expenses in Council of Aging? I mean, it's not a big number, but uh, the increase is a big number. So. 
So the increase in expenses in the Council on Aging is for a contract-based um, secretary to be uh, to, to do intake and to greet people as they come uh, into the Council on Aging. Anything else? Thanks. Anyone else in Health and Human Services? Seeing none, the next, someone put a hold on retirement. Mr. Jamison first, then Mr. Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Gordon. Jamison, Precinct 12. Um, first, um, I want to commend the body at, at large on the wonderful discussion we're having on our budget. Um, it's really thoughtful that we are able to have this. Second, you think all the things you've been told we should worry about, get, if any of those get your knickers in the bunch, the thing that really should is the retirement budget and the association associated OPEB budget. That's the other post-employment benefits read health care pension for our employees. We're going to spend $10 million between appropriations and the water and sewer, which is all our money. And by the end of the current five-year projection plan, that will be $13.5 million. Mr. Billiford, the chairman of the Contributory Retirement Board, kindly provided a re report uh, the other evening, and I really am appreciative of that. And I want to comment, uh, uh, use a, the words of a venture capitalist friend of mine. A venture capitalist, you might think it's all about the money. It's not. It's only about the money, and my comments are only about the money, not the personalities involved. So we have a little song and dance here. So this summarizes from the last 17 years available online that I looked at over the last weekend or so, uh, the annual rate of return of the contributory of our retirement plan. As you can see, we had good years and bad years. Um, actually, early on in 97 and 98, that's as far as back as I could easily access the retirement uh, board's uh, investments were outperforming the state. But there was only one other time in 2011 when the uh, retirement board's uh, assets outperformed the state. Uh, if you take that, next slide, please. Oh, actually, uh, there was an illusion, uh, a, a suggestion the other night that the reason that such a large loss happened in 2008 was because of the um, le pressure to transfer the funds to the state system. Everyone tanked that year. The Dow was down almost 34%. Next slide, please. If you had $100 at the end of 1996 and you'd invested it with the state and Arlington systems, you would have seen this type of growth, uh, neglecting uh, monies appropriated by the town and neglected distributions by either system in the state system, and the only other option we have, which is the uh, Arlington system and the state system. Arlington is blue, the state is red. You'll notice that in the end of 2013, with the last available numbers I checked again the other day, there's a $95 difference. What would that, what would that have been over time if we'd started in 96, if we'd been clairvoyant? Um, in 96, we had $80 million. That would have been about $75 million difference. Next slide, please. So that's a pretty tough, uh, description there. So let's say Retirement Board was doing quite well in 97, 98. But let's say after five or six, maybe seven years in 2005, they realized that maybe it was time to shift into the state. Next slide. Why might they have done that? Well, this shows you this, the Prim or Prit was uh, performing a full percentage point above Arlington over 20 years from 1985 to 2005. This information was provided to me by someone at the PRIM board uh, who involved, was involved in the management of the fund at that time and was shared with the Contributory Retirement Board in 2006-2007. You'll note that the PRIM actually gives a higher return at a slightly lower risk, and that is because it's a highly, highly diversified fund versus the limit diversity uh, that we have in the Contributory Retirement's past investments. And that's just basic uh, investment portfolio theory. I'm sure there's someone in the audience or at home who is a much better financial analyst than I am and can explain to that to the audience at some other time. Next slide, please. So that one percent difference, you don't think that's a lot, but if you started in, at the end of 84 with 100 bucks and you did that every year, at the end of 2005, you would have had about $120 more if you'd been in the state system then you've been through the self-managed approach. So if we had changed, let's say, in the beginning of 2006, next slide, please, we still would have done better. 
At the, at, at the end of 2005, we had $127.5 million. That difference you see on the right of the red over the blue is another $25, $27.5 million. Next slide, please. But uh, we, didn't, we actually didn't change until 2007, 2008, and the suggestion was that that was because of pressure. Um, I might suggest that um, the, the, the rationale for changing was over the previous four years, <coughs> um, the state, the Alliance system had underperformed on average the state system by 4%, and in 2007 it was actually almost, it was over 7% lower than the state. So we shifted in 2008, which I, I think is still a good idea. Next slide, please. And here's how we've done since then. And I was first dumbfounded by the fact that we're still less than the state except for 2011. And I went back and checked, and that's because, well, we didn't put all the money in the state. We only put 90% of it. Somehow we think that having 10% aside is still going to make us outperform the state. Next slide, please. So this is just a quick primer to say how we invest our money. And it, this is the thing that could kill us in the next 20 to 40 years if we don't get this right. Next slide. So the other thing that the Contributory Retirement Board manages is the OPEP. I have two issues with that. The Contributory Retirement Board does not currently, I believe, have any representation of the teachers. The OPEP covers all our employees, not just the non-teachers. They have their own retirement system. And it was put forth that this 1.6 difference isn't really that much. And over three years, this 10.2 in the Arlington system versus 11.8 in the state system, it's not much. You take 100 bucks, and it's $134 in one and 140 in the other. Not a big difference. But you run it out uh, 20 years, and you got 25 or 30% more. So next slide. This is something that I hope the manager, the board of selectmen, through their appointees to the board, the contributory retirement board, the finance committee, and our treasurer, and we as a town meeting focus on each and every year getting an understanding of what we're doing with our money because the more we earn in the market, the less we're gonna to have to appropriate here on the floor of town meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. 9.30, you wanna take a seven minute break?
The next speaker is Stephen Harrington. Mr. Harrington has the floor. Please be quiet in the hall. Take your conversations outside. Take your seats, Mr. Harrington. Motion to adjourn. Ha <laughs> just joking. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. Quiet in the hall, please. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. So, no facts and figures, no fancy graphs, no even not so fancy graphs. You have to speak right into the mic, Mr. Harrington. You can't hear me? Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. I don't have any fancy charts or non-fancy charts to show you, but I want to share some experience. First of all, if you look at the pension budget, you know, it, um, it's up 5.75% this year. That's a self-inflicted wound. Mr. Billifer pointed that out to us during his report to committees. And I want to I want to share some of my experience. Um, I managed pension funds for a long time. I actually sat on the board with Bill Miller. I don't know if anyone knows who Bill Miller was. He's a legendary fund manager who outperformed the S&P 500 for a gazillion years until he stopped, and then he never has since. And one of the things, if you look, if you go back, you say, okay, I made a decision in say 2007, 2008. But I'm going to go back to 1985 and look what I did or could have done. There's only one brokerage in the world that'll do that, and that's the woulda, shoulda, coulda brokerage. And uh, they don't actually let you do that. They don't let you make trades after the fact. And so you really have to look at sort of a big picture here. When you have funds investments, you want to have a fiduciary. And in the ecosystem of public pensions, that fiduciary is almost always a consultant. Uh, is high, sorry, that fiduciary hires a consultant. And that consultant makes sure that they do two things. One, they don't shoot themselves in the foot. And two, they don't whipsaw themselves. And so what you saw in 2007 was investments based on fear, a change based on fear. The fear was, we're going to be left behind. And I'll tell you right now, don't ever make an investment based on fear. Because that's exactly what happened, as you saw. You looked like you were being left behind. The motivating factor for that change was fear. We saw fear again. In 2009, in February 2009, some of the same people agitating for the change of the pension to the PRIT was also banging the drum because the treasurer had lost money during the market downturn. And it was in February of 2009 when the drums were beat the loudest. And for anyone in here who's a participant in the market, March of 2009 was the exact bottom. And it was fear again. That was fear that you're going to lose all your money. And so fear makes you buy at the top, like we did with the print in 2007. 2008. And fear is you sell at the bottom. That's what you're going to do in February of 2009. And so you can always see who should not invest your money. People base their actions on fear. And so it's just a lesson to learn. We lost $7 million, according to Mr. Billifer, had we not acted at that time. I think he was being generous because he only brought it down to the market bottom. In fact, he didn't consider the fact that then the compounded return since then in the greatest rally in the last six years, it's more like 10 million. It's a self-inflicted wound. We're going to pay for it with having our third largest budget have to increase by 5.75, 6% a year for, well, probably longer than we'll all be on town meeting. And so the one thing you want to make sure is that you have a fiduciary. It's their responsibility. They're going to hire a consultant who's going to tell them what to do. The last thing you want is people to come here telling you what to do based on the fear of being left behind or the fear of losing all your money. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. LaCourte. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15. My recollection from my time on the Board of Selectmen is that the reason that our pension budget goes up at the rate that it goes up is because of when we have to be fully funded. Can I get some confirmation of how we're doing on fully funding, what year it is we are supposed to um, be fully funded by, and um, how we are going about setting that rate relative to that? Mr. Tosti. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is correct. Under state law, uh, this system has to be fully funded by 2040. Um, the system right now under projections is to be fully funded in 2032. So in effect, we're not just funding our current expenses, we're catching up so the system could be fully funded by a certain point. Uh, and at that point, the, the cost will drop. Um, but that's the target right now is 2032. Okay, and so that's the rate, that's why we set it, the rate of increase at the six or five or whatever percent, because we're shooting for that goal? Well, the, the, um, for, for the last several years, it's been targeted at a 6% increase. Uh, during the, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, about a, a month or two, well, actually several months ago, mm -hmm. when the Long Range Planning Committee was meeting, uh, sort of a subcommittee of the uh, town manager, uh, and one of the vice chairs of the uh, finance committee, along with a member of the finance committee, went and met with the retirement board, uh, and they agreed to reduce their annual increase from 6% down to 5.5% okay. uh, until at least 2020. But their prime responsibility okay. is to make sure the system uh, becomes fully funded. Fully funded. So when you say we're going to be fully funded in 2032, and that will change our budget, can you tell me sort of what will happen? Well, my guess is um, 2032, okay. Um, <laughs> I know. My guess is uh, if we become fully funded in 2032, then we'll switch off and start pouring money into the uh, OPEB system so that system can be fully funded. Right now our OPEB liability, our, our, uh, this is basically health insurance for retirees, there's a bigger liability in the OPEB liability than there is in the pension system. But I think that's what will happen. Okay, great, thank you. Mr. Greco. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Rich Greco, Retirement Administrator for the Town of Arlington. Um, on behalf of the board, I just wanted to reiterate what Mr. Tosti was saying. The goal of the Retirement Board is to be funded in 20, fiscal 2032. State law requires it done by 2040. After we, we all witnessed in 2007, we were trying to leave some room in case there's another major downturn in the market. This would alleviate coming before town meeting and saying we need all this money this year to catch up on the losses. We're trying to come to a smooth level. Our numbers are <laughs> given to an actuary, our data, which is then approved and sent to the state actuary for approval for the funding schedule. We did meet with some of the members of the finance committee. They asked if we could do the growth at five and a half percent, and we were able to still maintain fiscal 2032 as a goal. So um, that's basically the goal of the retirement board, speaking on behalf of the retirement board, is to fund this as soon as we can, as Mr. Billifer told you the other night, and to absolutely take this burden off and to answer Ms. LaCourt's question. In 2032, the appropriation looks like it's gonna be around $20 million, figuring it that many years down the road. In 20, uh, fiscal 2033, it'll be $5 million. When it's over 105% funded, it will hopefully be zero. So the one difference on the four large budgets, this hopefully has an end date that'll eventually go away if we can fully fund it. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else on retirement? Seeing none. The next budget that was held was reserve fund. Someone want to talk about the reserve fund? Mr. Tosti, did you? I just wanted to explain the, uh, the increase, uh, which was a bit done at the last minute from a million to a million two. Um, at this point, the uh, school committee 
uh, the school department was hoping to put in at least $200,000 uh, into their stabilization fund uh, for special education. Uh, unfortunately, through, I don't know whose fault, and it really doesn't matter, uh, there was never a stabilization fund put into the warrant uh, for the uh, special ed. Therefore, there was no place for them to put the money. Uh, I worked with the uh, town council and the controller to find some kind of a solution. Uh, there really wasn't any other good solution, so I offered to the superintendent, if you promise to, put, to let $200,000 flow back to free cash in June 30th, we'll put 200,000 additional into the finance committee reserve fund, and that'll be available for you next year. It was sort of a wash, but that's the reason it's going up. Uh, and uh, it, it's really, we set it aside just for that purpose, and we'll get it back at June. So it's a, it's a wash for the town. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else on reserve funds? Seeing none. Someone put a hold on water and sewer enterprise fund. Mr. Fuller. Uh, Peter Fuller, Precinct 20. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, a few questions. I'm looking at the top line personnel services in water and sewer, 2095,000 2, and change. And if you go down to personnel services detail, it's 3,154,000 and change, a million fifty-nine higher. Um, then if you look at the top line expenses, 15,711,000, and you add up all the expenses, you get the same discrepancy, a million fifty-nine thousand in the other direction. So I'm wondering why these things don't match up. And we should do a better job on that next year. Uh, because you have the, part of that is in indirect expenses um, to total up to it. So. Uh, yeah, if I add up water, yeah. sewer, and indirect expenses, I get that figure that's a million fifty nine off from that top line expenses. <sighs> I'm embarrassed to say I'm not quite sure. Um, Mr. Chaplain, you going to give it a go? Adam Chaplain, town manager. It, it, Mr. Tosti was correct. It is, it's, it's in the calculation between both direct charges, employees of the water and sewer department, as well as the indirect charges that are attributable to uh, the town departments that uh, basically provide support or service uh, the charges. Th there's also a further breakdown where there are uh, direct charges attributable to the health care and pension costs of the employees of the water and sewer department as well as the contribution towards uh, health insurance and pensions to those town employees and other departments that service water sewer. We have a more detailed breakdown of how all those indirect costs comes together, which either myself or the deputy town manager would be able to share with you if you'd like. So the, I went through and added up all the offsets and the other budgets and it came out to about 3,246,000 and change. And, you know, I don't see how that matches into this anywhere. But between, I think, uh, a portion of labor, a portion of retirement, as well as a portion of the indirect charges, it, it, it should tie out to that number. Well, I would hope going forward we can get some greater transparency in the way this is presented, but thank you for all your work. Thank you, sir. Anyone else on water and sewer? Next budget that was held is recreation. Someone want to discuss recreation? Excuse me? Oh, okay. Um, Ed Burns Arena, someone held, someone held the ice rink. No one's volunteering, okay. And that was the last budget that was held. So the way we're going to do it, we're going to vote all the budgets at once, but first we're going to vote on Mr. Harrington's amendment. <clears throat> so once we vote that amendment up or down, then we will vote on the budgets as a whole. 
Is that clear? Okay, you ready? So first we're gonna vote Mr. Harrington's amendment. If you want, to, if you agree with Mr. Harrington's amendment, you want to vote yes, please vote one. If you do not agree with it, please vote two. And go ahead and vote. One, yes, I want it. Two, no, I don't. One hundred and sixty four in the negative, twenty four in the affirmative, it is defeated. Four, no, one hundred forty six. Okay, now we're going to vote on the recommended vote as presented by the Board of the Finance Committee. I'm sorry. Are you ready? If you want to vote yes on the budgets, please press one. If you want to vote no, please press two and go ahead and vote. One for yes, two for no. Hundred ninety two in the affirmative, four in the negative is an affirmative vote, and I do declare it. And four in the negative. That ends budget twenty two. Mr. Tosti. I move that Article twenty be taken off the table. We have a motion to take Article twenty off the table. All in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed? Article 20 is off the table. It is now before okay. us. This is the collective bargaining articles. Uh, there's a sheet that was left on your desk, on your desk, I wish we had them, <laughs> on your chairs today. Uh, and this explains all the different, all of the collective bargaining units uh, have uh, settled uh, except one. And uh, that's uh, pending a final vote by the union membership, but all are settled for three years. And I think there was, there was a lot of um, uh, negotiation strategy and philosophy in entering this, and therefore I'd like to have the town manager uh, give you a, b a bit of an overview uh, before you vote on this. Thank you. Mr. Chapdelaine. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, as Mr. Tosti just said, we, we certainly did have a strategy in approaching collective bargaining this year. Uh, very simply, that we would offer a cost of living that was guided by uh, a historical consumer price index in the Northeast market of 2% for a general wage increase uh, for each year. Uh, but then also taking a look at the salary study that was conducted last year and also provided the town meeting at areas of inequity uh, to try to move certain positions within bargaining units uh, up to midpoint uh, in terms of our 12 comparable communities. Uh, so if you look throughout, you can again see um, the agreement on 2% cost of living in each of the three years. Uh, but then also, uh, based on uh, different bargaining units, uh, various approaches, for example, in the uh, fire uh, bargaining unit, uh, you can see uh, mention of um, implementation of a new step system for positions, again, to try to achieve that, that parity or midpoint towards parity. Uh, and another example would be within the Patrolman's Association. Um, looking at patrolmen who are not currently eligible for the Quinn Bill or the educational incentive and slowly phasing them in to once again be eligible for that educational incentive uh, so that we don't have an inequity within the bargaining unit and also an inequity among our comparable communities, all of which offered an educational incentive to all of their police officers. So that was an important piece for uh, both equity and recruitment and retention. Um, aside from that, uh, I think it was a very productive uh, bargaining session with all units. We're very pleased to be able to come here uh, with all of the bargaining units uh, settled, with one to still ratify, as is stated in the vote, and we ask for your uh, favorable disposition. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Maher, I have one preliminary question, though. Mr. Tosti, whoops, he went away. Or maybe, the um, thing that was on our chair tonight, is this substituting the recommended vote in your booklet in full? Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Marr. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Marr, Precinct 14. Uh, just a brief word, uh, having been involved in collective bargaining negotiations for the, with the town, for the town, for about 30 years, this is a singular achievement, not only for the town manager as bargaining agent, but also for the unions to have come together. Uh, it's been rare in the past when we've been presented with all of the unions being in agreement. And I think it's hats off to the unions, particularly hats off to the manager and his negotiating team, and I think it's fair to the taxpayers. I hardly uh, suggest that uh, we uh, support this uh, uh, mutual effort by the uh, town collective bargaining units and the town management. Anyone else wish to discuss the collective bargaining budgets? Seeing none, we're going to take two votes. The first one was we're going to substitute what was on our chair tonight for what was in the Finance Committee book because it incorporates all of the unions and all the um, final negotiated settlements with all those unions. Are you just queued up for one vote? Two, okay. So first we're going to vote to substitute Mr. Tosti's uh, substitute that was on our chairs was in labeled amendment. We're going to call it a substitute. So all in favor of Mr. Tosti's substitute, please say yes or yes. vote, excuse me. <laughs> vote yes by pressing one, vote no by pressing two, and go ahead. Old habits are hard to break. It is substituted 194 to 3. That brings us to the recommended vote of the Finance Committee as substituted. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 2020. 511. Unanimous. That brings us to Article 23. Appropriation, reevaluation, real property. We have the recommended vote of the Finance Committee for 50000 Does anyone wish to discuss it? Seeing none, all in favor, please say, oh, you want to discuss it? You're on a roll, no one does. Uh, Paul Tierney, Director of Assessments. Uh, every three years, cities and towns need to go under a reval project in fiscal 16 is that year for Arlington. Uh, we are contracting with an outside firm to do the res uh, commercial, industrial, personal property, and in income producing properties. The assessors will be handling single family, two family, three family, and condos. We request that the town appropriate $50,000 to fund the reval project. Thank you. Anyone wish to discuss $50,000 to fund the reevaluation project? Seeing none, we're ready for a vote. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That brings us to Article 29. Appropriations committees. Yep. We have the recommended vote of the Finance Committee for $25,000 for various committees and commissions. Anyone wish to discuss this? Seeing none, we're ready for a vote. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 29, brings us to Article 30. Appropriation town celebrations, $10,167 for various committees, flags, etc. Anyone wish to discuss it? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That brings us to Article 31. Appropriation miscellaneous, $8,500 appropriated for legal defense, indemnification, and medical costs. Anyone wish to discuss it? Seeing none, we're ready for a vote. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Brings us to Article 32. Appropriation public east, public art, East Arlington, Mass Ave <coughs> Corridor. We have a recommended vote of $12,000. Anyone wish to discuss it? We have three people, uh, Mr. Chapdelain first, then Mr. Harrington, then Mr. Fuller. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Adam Chapdelaine, Town Manager. I just wanted to give a brief description of what this uh, warrant article is requesting. It's a request for funds to fund uh, the help or, or the work of a consultant to help the town manage uh, a proposed public art process for the Mass Ave corridor in East Arlington. Uh, there are several sites along the corridor that were approved uh, by the Board of Selectmen several years ago with the request of Arlington Public Art, a subsidiary of Vision 2020. Uh, those two sites are the intersections of Grafton Street and Mass Ave, as well as the intersection of Cleveland Street and Mass Ave at the Fox Library. The idea would be to solicit proposals for permanent uh, public art exhibitions at those two sites to sort of tie into the, uh, the, the, the goal of added vibrancy uh, in the commercial and retail district in East Arlington. Uh, what the funds requested would go for is uh, the planning uh, of a public art solicitation process, so the designing of a solicitation process, as well as holding uh, at least two community meetings with the public to solicit feedback. Uh, following that, uh, managing the process as, of uh, selection and community engagement, recruiting artists, managing their submissions, uh, as well as facilitating public input and interviews of those artists for their submissions. Uh, and then finally, some reviews and approvals uh, of whatever public art submissions we would receive. So selecting artists uh, and then reviewing their plans and getting them ready for fabrication and installation. Uh, what this doesn't uh, fund is that fabrication or installation of the public art. Uh, I would presume uh, that we'd be looking at fundraising or grant writing uh, for the majority of the cost of any fabrication and installation, uh, but we are asking for uh, town funds to support this planning, solicitation, and community engagement process. Thank you. Mr. Harrington, Sean. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Sean Harrington, Precinct 15. Um, I was just curious, Mr. Moderator, mo <coughs> sorry, Mr. Moderator, if we could find out uh, how much funds have been raised from the, uh, for the Public Arts Council at all? A little far afield of this, but you have an answer, Mr. Chaplain? Adam Chaplain, Town Manager, are you referring to Arlington Public Art and the Fund for Public Art that was created last year? The committee that was created two years ago, yeah. Uh, so I don't have uh, an accounting of uh, that account available right now, but I do know that that account has become a fund that enables uh, programs like Art Rocks Monotomy <laughs> Park last year, Art Rocks by Pond, which just opened this weekend, as well as Cheerful Where You Sit. Uh, those act as fundraisers, but they also have used that fund to take money in uh, from donations and then support those projects going forward. So I, I, could, uh, I could provide you with an accounting of that fund. And um, just for my own sake, and I'll j I'm imagining that this is closely connected with that committee, correct? And helping it's it out. It's absolutely an initiative of that committee. Okay. The reason why I bring that up is because uh, two years ago, now not all of you were here, two years ago I was, um, we had a, uh, this came up to us about creating this committee, and at that time the current, uh, or then chairman of the Board of Selectmen made a comment that uh, the intent of the Board of Selectmen at that time was creating a committee solely as a vehicle for donations. Um, you know, there was concern by people whether or not we were going to use this for actual public funding. If we were going to spend tax dollars on funding public art, not that anyone was against public art, but the idea of using tax dollars, especially now with our, more now with our budget um, growth becoming smaller, spending money on public art. And uh, the, I believe it was Mr. Hainer who brought up that point. And while the current chair, or the then chair of the Board of Selectmen said, well, legally, you could use tax dollars to fund it. It was not the intent of the Board of Selectmen at the time to um, <clears throat> use public funds to uh, push along public arts projects or to push the committee along. It was solely for donations. Um, in my opinion, that's not just talking about installment of art. That's the committee, period. Um, when you say that this is a vehicle for donations, I was expecting that anything that had to do with this committee whether it's a survey, I don't care how much the survey costs, or installation of the art, it was supposed to be for private donations that this was solely a vehicle to push this forward. Now people are gonna say, well, you don't, you know, uh, it, we never really said that, but if you look at the tape, if you actually look at it, it was clearly said the intent of the committee was for a vehicle for private funds. Now I like the idea that we're doing a survey on this, but I don't like the idea of it being used with tax dollars. What I would rather see, if anything, is that the committee raised the funds themselves and then spend 
their own money that they have raised for the $12,000 survey. I think that'd be a lot better um, idea seeing as two years ago we, made, we passed this under the assumption that no, at least to my knowledge, that no public funds were going to be used for this. Um, <clears throat> or if anything, I'd like to see if the committee would raise funds to reimburse the town the $12,000. Um, I don't, Mr. Moderator, would that be a possibility at all to have the committee raise the $12,000 eventually and, pay, and reimburse the town for the survey? I'm not saying that's their intent, but would that be possible? Can you repeat the question? Would, the com um, would it be possible for the Public Arts uh, Committee to raise $12,000 um, in private funds to repay the town for this survey? I guess it's technically possible. Um, Mr. Chaplain is gonna tell you something about it. <laughs> Adam Chaplain, town manager, uh, I think it is technically feasible, but it's not what's being requested under this article. On that note, I'd ask you to vote this down. Not because this is against public art, this is not against service, but two years ago we were told that the intent of this committee was not to use public funding. The intent was solely as a vehicle of donations, private donations. We made a commitment then, we need to uphold that commitment now. Just because it's been two years doesn't mean the intent should change. The point of intent and the point of, you know, of making those type of promises is that they, change regard they don't change regardless of progress or years forward. They're always the same. So please vote against this and have the committee fund their own surveys privately. Thank you. Mr. Fuller? Yes. Mr. McKinney? Lawrence McKinney, 7th Precinct. I very, very rarely actually get telephone calls from my constituents about specific warrants, but I did get one about this one from a constituent who uh, was concerned that this amount of money was being spent on public art. As I have heard from Mr. Harrington, this is not really being spent on public art, but spent on figuring out how to do public art. I, and it strikes me that $12,000, which as you know is twice what it cost me to put together the entire of Uncle Sam Plaza, is really a rather a large amount of money. The second part being that this is a repeat of what we had for our 200th celebration. I applied to be on that particular committee because I have a background of raising money. I started several corporations and I am a secretary at the Harvard Business School and we have to raise money from people who have money. And I came up with several fundraising possibilities for the 200th during the summer because they had said, we do not want money, we will raise the money. You bet they raised the money. They had a, uh, spent all their money on a, a sort of a beginning party and then there was no more money. They came back and asked the town for some money and they came back and asked the town for some more money and then finally all patted themselves on the back and said, we are giving you back some of the money that we said we wouldn't ask you for before and they all clapped. Now, this is a, a repeat of the same thing, apparently. They said, we want to do something and we're going to get private, you'd think with a town full of people with residences that, you know, cost what they cost, we'd have a few people in this town who are rich enough to contribute to something like this if a appeal was made. And that's what I'm only asking. If an appeal was made, they didn't even try. The 200th committee did not even try to raise money actually making a few phone calls. It can be done. There are people out here who are willing to support the arts, and if you're out there in TV land, come forward. We don't have to ask the taxpayers to do this. I know you're there. Okay, thank you. Bluso. Ted Peluso from uh, Precinct 6. Good, I wasn't sure. Uh, there's a uh, there's three centers to this town. There's the center, there's East Arlington, and there's the Heights. Now, if I understand what this is for, and I might not be up to date on this stuff, I thought it was 
to continue the practice that started with the center to do some of the power uh, units, right? Now, let me tell you a secret. The East Arlington people feel left out. Now, how do I know that? Because they've told me. <laughs> they've told me as part of ATED. So whether you're gonna spend the 12,000 or not spend the 12,000, it seems to me there is a whole issue of whether or not uh, a significant population in this town, maybe we should have stopped it way back when, but if you've done it in the center, and now you're gonna say, well, guess what? We're not gonna do it in East Arlington. Not so good, okay? Ms. Flukleger? Molly Flukiger, Precinct 4. I just want to say that I support um, this and I support tax money, a modest amount. Well, maybe not, just, this is a modest amount for um, public art. And I also agree with the previous speaker that those of us in East Arlington, we often sometimes complain when things aren't, uh, when people don't ask our opinion. So if this is for organizing, it would be money well spent to make sure that uh, this is something we appreciate and we all enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ruderman. Yes. Mr. Slickman. Paul Slickman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate under all items under this article. A motion to terminate under Article 32. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is a two-thirds vote, and I so declare. Now we're going to have to terminate debate on Article 32. We have before us recommend a vote of the Finance Committee. You all set? So recommend a vote of $12,000. Um, if you want to spend the $12,000 for art, you will press 1 and vote yes. If you do not, you'll vote 2 for no. And vote 1 for yes, 2 for no. Is it 130 in the affirmative, 62 in the negative? It is an affirmative vote, and that closes Article 32. And that brings us to Article 33. Um, <clears throat> Finance Committee, Appropriations, Human Rights Commission, Mr. Tosti. I would like to make a small amendment to the recommendation of the uh, Finance Committee, which yes, hopefully sir. will be up on the screen. Oh, okay. Basically, it adds that the Board of Selectmen and then adds the words that you see up there, and Town Manager, comma, in collaboration with the Arlington Human Rights Commission, comma, and then everything else is the same. Do you want to add in the words and Town Manager Commer in collaboration with the Arlington Human Rights Commission into the first line. All right. Do I have a second on that? Okay, go ahead. <coughs> this issue was brought on by a 10 register voter article um, about pr primarily involving around the executive director of the Human Rights Commission and that there um, wasn't any uh, officially appointed director of the Human Rights Commission. Uh, Finance Committee sort of looked at this, um, and some of the comment that we have down there is, that I have there is incorrect. Um, we were under the impression that basically the Executive Director of, the, uh, of Human Services uh, served in that function. Apparently a little bit of disagreement on that. Now, there is an appropriation for the Human Rights Commission that you've already appropriated uh, for $4,500 for staff support. But um, there's never really been any particular need for uh, a human rights director uh, because the, the amount of the workload that comes in to the Human Rights Commission is, is not huge. Uh, and they've been able to handle it very well um, on their own. So the Human Rights 
executive director under the bylaws is an appointee of the town manager and the board of selectmen. So rather than, than the finance committee getting involved with a management issue, uh, we requested that the board of selectmen and the town manager in consultation with the human rights commission investigate this issue and then come back next year and say, do we need a human rights commission, uh, director, uh, executive director? If we don't, then modify the bylaws to take that requirement out. Uh, if you do think we need one, then the manager and the board of selectmen should appoint one. Um, and if there's need for some additional funds there, they can make a recommendation. Uh, so basically, um, th this is the heart of our recommendation. Uh, ask the board of selectmen and the manager, look into the issue, come back to us next year. Uh, do they see a problem? If they do, what's the solution? And they'll come back before this body at that. Now I know there's a substitute motion um, to appoint a new committee uh, from town meeting. And I hope you vote against that um, because this is really not a policy issue. It's a management issue. It's not what is done, but how it's done. Um, the issue in Article 30 is the importance and role of the executive director position. Position is recommended by the town manager and approved by the board of selectmen. That's why the finance committee recommended that this go back to the board of selectmen and the town manager, research it together, work with the human rights, Arlington Human Rights Commission, and come back to this body next year. There is no particular need to take specific action right now. The Human Rights Commission is, is doing a good job uh, with what it does, um, but they can study this and decide if there needs to be any changes. So I recommend uh, the Finance Committee motion as, uh, as amended to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harrington. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. Um, I agreed with Mr. Tossi with everything he said, except at the um, part about not supporting the substitute motion. The substitute motion is very similar to what the FinCom found out, that there's some need to look at the bylaw that is the Human Rights Commission. And before I start, there's nothing personal to me in this. I have no personal interest in how the Human Rights Commission works or doesn't work. I have an interest for the town because I think it's an important body. Um, how many out there have actually read the bylaw? So I show of hands. One, two, three, four, five, maybe 10 people. Well, if you read the bylaw, you're gonna see that it's a well-crafted bylaw. It's one of the few where there's a statutory requirement for a position, the executive director. And the executive director is not like just someone who takes notes or anything, there's specific requirements for what the executive director is. And most importantly, the executive director is someone that you go to if you have a complaint, you know, between the me monthly meetings. And so the executive director is a very important role. And the bylaw says there shall be an executive director and that it will be a town employee and it, he or she will report to the town manager and that, you know, that the qualifications are, you know, extensive experience in the um, in history with human rights. And so in, back in December when I went to, you know, find the executive director, I couldn't, and hence this warrant article was born. I was told that, you know, there was no funding because, well, you guys didn't fund it. Um, and it turns out that, you know, um, the FinCom agrees with me, everyone agrees that we have to look at the bylaw for that. But if you start looking more closely at the bylaw, you're gonna find a lot of other things in there. And it's an amazing, commission, the commissioners have a lot of authority. One of the things that the commissioners can do that you're not going to find in any other bylaw is um, they can compel testimony under oath. <laughs> they can require that departments, including the school department, give documents. And if you look at the bylaw, you're going to find lots of things in there that actually structurally should have a closer look 22 years later. And so all I'm recommending is absolutely do what the FinCom wants, but go one step better and have five people picked by the moderator, 
mostly out of this group, and I'd volunteer, to look at the whole thing and restructure it. And as I already showed you, this reason, I mean, you'd have to sort of not be aware of the world that the greatest civil rights issue of our time is a de facto discrimination by public entities. And this bylaw doesn't handle that. For an example, if you had a complaint against a town and the Human Rights Commission needed to hire counsel, the bylaw says that our town council will represent them. Well, I think our town council does a great job, but he can't represent the Human Rights Commission looking into a town department. There's a conflict there. There's no budget, there's no money to actually hire outside counsel. And he could recommend it, and I'm sure he would. You know, he's, very, you know, he's a very competent person. But I think that what's key is that if you look through that bylaw, you're gonna find lots of examples where structurally it doesn't fit into the 21st century. And I think we owe it to the people who drafted that bylaw back in 1993 to look through it and just come back and make recommendations. Usually I come up here and say, okay, here's a problem. I did that back in Article 9. There's absolutely a problem in Arlington that should be looked at. I then say, why you care? Well, you know, we do care because unlike, you know, um, I forget the previous speaker's name about his milk and cookies and someone should just sue the town. Well, I think that's not a good response. I think that we really owe it to ourselves to have a good insurance policy. And that is what this bylaw was all about, was to have an insurance policy, an outlet for people to have complaints and for us to handle it internally. And then finally, I usually say, oh, this is a solution and this is what I want you to vote on. I don't have the solution. I haven't had the solution from day one. And I think that it's gonna require some amount of thought and effort to come up with a solution so that this Human Rights Commission can be effective and have enough um, uh, um, relevance to actually deal with the great civil rights issue of our time. Thank you. Mr. O'Brien. Uh, Andy O'Brien, uh, Precinct 16. Uh, Mr. Moderator, um, did the Human uh, Rights Commission ever make a determination about the reason why uh, students of color are suspended at much greater rates? Is someone from the commission here? Jerry? Miss Barry? Miss Barron. Yeah, that's it. Took me three tries. <clears throat> Sherry Barron, <clears throat> Precinct 7 and member of the Human Rights Commission. We did not investigate that because no complaint was brought to us. The issue was brought to us by the proponent, but no direct complaint was brought to us. So you, you um, the proponent, um, was that was not in a form of complaint or, or request or anything like that? Moderator, um, the proponent brought the issue before us and we formed a subcommittee to investigate the matter and that is ongoing, but we don't have an individual who brought the complaint to us, which is the procedure. So you, you have an investigation going on, but we won't know what happens to that investigation unless someone brings forth a formal complaint. I, I'm a little confused. Well, you can come to our meeting, and you would find out at our meeting. Yeah. But we don't have an individual. The procedure is that an individual comes to us or makes a phone call and brings a complaint to the commission. Okay. We then form a subcommittee of two or three people to investigate that complaint. The proponent came to us with that issue gotcha, as an John. issue of concern gotcha. to him, and we said that we would take this on with a group of three and investigate it as best we could with the school committee and come back with a response. Well, I, I personally was not aware of, um, you know, the elevated suspension rates. Um, bring it back to the article. But 
Well, yes, and about we're talking about forming committees. Okay, well, I, I, the, these questions will determine, for, at least for me anyhow, the, these answers whether uh, Mr. Harrington's um, warrant article is, is worth uh, voting for. Um, if, if indeed that nothing is, will happen to this issue, I, I think I might be inclined okay. to vote for Mr. Harrington's uh, warrant article. Excuse me, Mr. Moderator, may I make no. a comment? I, I never said nothing will happen. I said that we are looking into it. Yeah, there's colloquy going. Yes. No, 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 there's no, no question right at the moment. No, he was, he no, made no, a no, hey, stop, I'm stop. Responding to it. No, no, you have to wait till there's a question right. presented. It, finish your question, Mr. O'Brien. Okay. I've just been finding it kind of confusing, you know, um, that, okay, there is an investigation going on, but there's not a formal complaint. Will there be a response or something like that? Um, if there isn't a formal response, then maybe I, I see uh, some value in Mr. Harrington's Warren article. If there's, you know, if, if we are going to get a response and, and, and a recommendation, then, then maybe, maybe, maybe it's not. But um, right now, I, I seem to be a little confused. Thank you. Woman over here, yep, ma'am. I'm not sure I don't got your name yet. <clears throat> Kayla May, Precinct 20. This time I'm going to talk into the mic. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say, you know, very briefly, um, I come from a background where this is something I, you know, employment discrimination is something that I do all the time, and I know that the Human Rights Commission um, goes beyond that. So I'm an employment attorney, and I have substantial experience representing particularly low-income people. And I think it's important to look at what agencies like this do in the f in, within the function of all the other agencies that exist both in Massachusetts and federally. And I think it's really worth noting, and, and honestly within the scope, to note that the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination, which handles all types of employment um, and housing and public accommodations um, issues is seriously underfunded. So investigators at the MCAD have hundreds of cases where they used to have dozens. And the reason why this is pertinent here is because robust agencies um, at the administrative level do a tremendous amount to support the civil rights of individuals either who don't have a lot of money or in situations where what's at stake isn't worth the dollars and cents of an attorney. So I'll say that People who come through my door very often I can't help because there's not enough hours in the day and there's not enough money out there. So a robust agency goes really far. Now it may be that we put together a committee and we realize that what's happening is what should happen and what we should do is change the bylaw. But this town meeting exists to look at things like this and in the absence of a committee it feels to me like we get a recommendation back in a year that we see right before we vote for it so some input from town committee um, is an essential way to make sure that there's a check, which doesn't mean that a committee isn't going to look obviously at what the Human Rights Commission thinks because they're the best people to do it or what the town, what the town manager thinks should be done. But that's why we're here, I think. So thank you. Next speaker is Peter Fiore. I just want to remind people that we're talking about whether we're going to form one of two type of committees, not whether or not we like the Human Rights Commission or whether it does great stuff. Mr. Fury. so let's try and keep it on the scope of, okay, the two proposed committees. Mr. Wagner? What's your point of order? Well, if, if that's, they're forming a committee with of their own right. Mr. Wagner, pass. Mr. Harrington, Sean, pass. Mr. Hayner, pass. Mr. Deist. No, wait, Mr. D I'm just r recognizing you for the list. John Deist, Precinct 13. Uh, I would like to try to bring forward to the town meeting, if the moderator will, will permit me, uh, a little bit of information about how it is that the Human Rights Commission works right now. 
So my, my question, Mr. Moderator, is addressed to maybe Mrs. Barron, but someone on the Human Rights Commission who can talk about the process by which one brings forward an issue. No, to... uh, that's beyond the, the scope of the article. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Ms. Rowe? Um, Clarissa Rowe, Precinct 4. I rise to ask you to reject the amendment. Um, for you all that are new to town meeting, I have been a selectman. I have been party to the kinds of um, incidents that our Human Rights Commission takes care of, and they have included things like um, hate literature being dropped. And I think the current structure as it stands now does an excellent job with the town leadership and with the police chief and the police of taking care of the kinds of complaints that we need to be taken care of. And I do appreciate the lawyer um, that came up to um, question that, and we should in town meeting question it. But I think this is one place where we're doing a really good job, and I'd like to see us continue that structure and I'd ask the new town meeting member, the lawyer, to, to possibly join the commission. Thank you. Sir. Steve Revelock, Precinct 1. Uh, Mr. Moderator, would, it be able to, would we be able to see a copy of Mr. Harrington's amendment on the screen? Yeah, it was on everybody's chairs, I believe, last week. On the 23rd, you put it out? Do you have it, Dave? I apologize for lack of my pre preparedness, but I cannot I find have, it in I my bag. I have several extra copies here if you'd like one. Do you, do you need one? Gentleman in the back in the red shirt. Ah. Micah Tremblay, Precinct 21. Um, I would like to remind everybody, in light of Mrs. Uh, Rowe's comments, that the Human Rights Commission I'm sure does very excellent work, and this is not about whether they do good work or not. This is about forming a commission to determine whether or not we need to update them. And so, if they're doing the, the job that they're supposed to be doing, then there's no reason to update the bylaw. And this commission is just going to kind of reassure this to town meeting. If we do need to update a couple of things, then we update them. And I propose to, that we support Mr. Harrington's amendment because it's gonna take the load off of, I believe it'll take the load off of the selectmen who are already very much burdened with a lot of work. So it's a volunteer commission. It will not require any extra town funding. So I urge you to support this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Coro. Thank you very much. Joe Chioro, Precinct 15, also a member of the uh, Board of Selectmen, and uh, with all due respect to the last uh, speaker, you already have five uh, people who's, who are vested with the responsibility of looking at this type of policy recommendation and bringing forth recommendations, <clears throat> and I'm happy to be one of them. I want to give you three numbers to think about, 3, 13, and 22. <clears throat> the Human Rights Commission actually has three appointing bodies. This is very unusual for the types of commissions that we appoint. Six of the members are appointed by the school committee, five by the moderator, five by the town manager with the uh, agreement of the um, board of selectmen. Actually, I think, I, I'm sorry, it's five, four, and four. 
There are 13 members, so it's actually a fairly large uh, commission, and it has the benefit of having some veterans who've been on since the very first day, and some who are brand new. There's actually, a, having that, that large a, a um, commission actually allows for new blood to come through and uh, new ideas. As a matter of fact, we just confirmed an appointment tonight at the Board of Selectmen's meeting. The commission has been in existence for 22 years, and I wasn't around at that time, but I understand from the veterans that the debate over this was, was long, um, heated, and very uh, thoroughly um, vetted. I um, actually had the privilege of serving as a commissioner for two years. I was the chair for one year. And I understand some of the confusion. I know Mr. O'Brien came up. That there is a difference between issues of concern and uh, complaints. But one thing I'll tell you is that I, I don't think that during my time as a uh, commissioner that we felt the, um, the need or the lack of an executive director, which is what this warrant article originally um, addressed. What we did rely on, however, was uh, having our office staff and our administrator. And during my time there, um, we had a wonderful uh, administrator, Marilyn Carnell, many of you may have known her, and she unfortunately passed away uh, about a year, year and a half ago. And so this is one, one burden that I think the commission has been uh, laboring under is, is the lack of the administrative staff. And I understand that that job has been posted and that um, there's a process underway now to, to refill that. That's an immediate need as far as implementation uh, goes. Furthermore, it's uh, also my understanding, and uh, the town manager can confirm or deny this, my understanding from what the town manager uh, said to us that he, he, has, he intends to um, go to the next commission meeting to discuss with them the state of the executive director and uh, whether or not the um, <clears throat> formalizing the Director of Health and Human Services, either as a de facto um, executive director or discussing other potential ideas for satisfying this, this, um, this part of the bylaw uh, might be on the table. With that in mind, there is a lot in motion. Uh, it's actually very consistent with what the Finance Committee is recommending to this body. So I would urge you to, to um, vote against Mr. Harrington's um, uh, substitute and to support the Finance Committee's uh, motion. Thank you. Ms. Deschler. Christine Deschler, Precinct 19. I move to terminate debate on this article. On, on all issues before it? Okay, motion to terminate debate under the article on all issues before us. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is a two-thirds vote, and I so declare it. That terminates debate. We have before us the recommended vote of the Finance Committee and Mr. Harrington's motion. Did we get a second on Mr. Harrington's motion? Second, second. thank you. May I, sir? Um, we are gonna vote on that after Mr. Harrington's substitute. So first we're gonna vote on Mr. Harrington's substitute. Then we'll vote on Mr. Um, Tosti's amendments if the Mr. Harrington substitute is not affirmative, and then we'll vote on the final vote. So first it's Mr. Harrington substitute motion. If you are in favor of, can you throw his up there again? Oh no, Mr. Harrington substitute, so everybody doesn't have it can see it. What's that? Oh, it's too small? So you guys gotta send these things to Dave Good in um, Word format so he can actually put it up there in big so there it is he wants to establish a committee of five members who are appointed by the moderator for purpose of studying article title two article nine human rights commission report back to the 2016 town meeting whether they make any changes so first we're going to vote on that all in favor will vote press one all opposed will press two as soon as mr renault is up so if you want Mr. Harrington's amendment, press one. If you do not, press two.
We have 42 in the affirmative and 151 in the negative. The amendment is defeated. That brings us to Mr. Tosti's amendment to add after the words that the Board of Selectmen and the Town Manager Calm are in collaboration with the Arlington Human Rights Commission. He wants to add that in. All in favor of adding that in, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is an affirmative vote and it is so amended. Now we have before us the recommended vote of the Finance Committee as amended. Mr. Renault? Uh-oh, what the heck was that? If you're in favor of the, uh, the recommended vote of the Finance Committee, please press one. If you oppose, press two. One for yes, two for no. It is 161 in the affirmative, 24 in the negative. It is an affirmative vote, and I so declare. And that closes Article 33 and brings us to Article 34. Appropriations for water bodies. Anyone want to discuss the appropriation for water bodies, $40,000? Seeing none, it appears we're ready for a vote. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. Unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 34, brings us to Article 35. Appropriation High Every Barber Community Service Program, $7,500, raised by general taxes. And Mr. Kleiman wishes to discuss it. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stuart Kleiman, Precinct 1. Um, for those who have been here for a long time, um, I, for one, still miss Harry Barber. And this is a wonderful way to remember him. But the reason I speak is I happened to talk with somebody fairly recently who knew nothing about the program. And it turned out that her husband had retired and their taxes were high. So I explained the program. This is a wonderful program, but I think we might need to do a little bit of a better job of getting it out to the public so they're aware of it. Thank you. Can someone in the Treasurer's Department make sure they do that in the future. Anyone else we should discuss to Harry Bob's program? We're ready for a vote. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That Closes Article 35, brings us to Article 36. Appropriation Battle Road, Scenic Byway, Re Revolution Road, $5,000 for the Scenic Byway, the Revolutionary Road. Anyone wants to discuss that? Mr. Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. I rise to support this, but would a note, if I could, uh, one of the things I've noticed in the town, along with so many other signs that we have, is a sign that basically announces the Paul Revere Ride. The Paul Revere Ride signs, for what it is worth, are bleached out now by the sun that you can barely read them. Now, I'm guessing that with this memorandum of understanding, we're acknowledging that this Battle Road Scenic Byway taking in all these towns, I can agree with that. But I find it unusual that on Patriot's Day, we gather at the town hall to acknowledge Paul Revere announcing the British are coming, but yet we don't do anything about the signs as they're being bleached out by the weather. I would make an, a motion maybe or a, an idea to basically say either stop acknowledging Paul Revere and Patriots Day at town hall 
or at least repair the signs to announce that this is the way Paul Revere rode his horse. Thank you. Good idea. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Anyone else wish to discuss the scenic byway? <coughs> Seeing none, we're ready for a vote. All in favor, recommend the vote of the Finance Committee. Please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. Okay, it is a affirmative vote, and I so declare. That closes Article 36, brings us to Article 37, Appropriation Pension Fund, former 25-year accidental disability, recommended vote of zero dollars. Anyone want to discuss zero dollars? <laughs> Seeing none. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Article, that closes Article 37, brings us to Article 38, Appropriation, OPEB. Other post-employment benefits. Um, my calculation about $868,000. Anyone wish to discuss that? No one wants to discuss OPEB. Okay, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 68, excuse me, 38. It brings us to Article 13.9. I recommend a vote of the Finance Committee for no action. All in favor of no action, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's unanimous vote for no action. I so declare it. That brings us to Article 40, uh, Long-Term Stabilization Fund. $100,000 be appropriated to the Long-Term Stabilization Fund. Anyone wish to discuss that? All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Madam Clerk, do you declare that there are more than 68, 86 town meeting members present voting in the affirmative? Yes. yes, thank you. Article, that closes Article 41. Brings, article 40 brings Article 41, Appropriation Overlay Reserve Fund. $350,000 will be appropriated to the Overlay Reserve Surplus Account. Anyone wish to discuss that? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 41. Brings us to Article 42. Uh, transfer Fund Cemetery. They want to transfer $150,000 to the Cemetery Commission, so the care of cemeteries, and $10,000 for the capital budget, and $150,000. Oh, 100, 100, $60,000 in total. Anyone wish to discuss cemetery funds? Seeing none. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. It's a near unanimous vote. It's affirmative vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 42. It brings us to Article 43. Use of free cash. I love free cash. Three million four hundred thirty-five thousand eight hundred forty-six dollars to be transferred into free cash. Anyone want to discuss free cash? Seeing none, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's an affirmative, unanimous vote, and I so declare it. That closes Article 43. Brings us to Article 44, Appropriations Faith School Stability Fund. We are going to. Appropriate two million seven hundred eighty-two thousand seven hundred sixty-three dollars to the fiscal stability fund. Anyone wish to discuss this? Seeing none, we're ready for a vote. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Unanimous vote. Madam Clerk, do you declare that there are eighty-six town meeting members present and voted in the affirmative? Thank you. That closes Article Forty-Five. Brings us to Art. Excuse me, Article Forty-Four, and brings us to Article Forty-Five. Resolution, town meeting member removal process. Uh, Mr. Greeley first, then Mr. O'Connor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, but having voted in the uh, minority on this, I'm going to ask uh, through you, sir, that Vice Chairman Diane Mahan speak on it. Hi, Diane Mahon, member of the Board of Selectmen. Um, this was a 3-2 vote, um, having voted in the majority. Uh, basically, it's what 
is stated in the report from the Board of Selectmen, the town moderator posed okay. that um, he would like to explore and have a conversation with town meeting members um, about an issue that several people had raised to him concerning um, absenteeism and should there be a process by which um, to even look into um, if a town meeting member ha um, has an extended um, absence from town meeting, um, should there be some sort of process that they go through. Um, I voted myself personally because the town moderator indicated that he'd like to have this conversation with town meeting members. Is this something that they would like to see? I did say for myself personally that um, I know there have been times when people have come up to me and said, you know, so and so, Diane Mahan from Precinct 14 didn't show up all year long. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to vote them back in. I have always cautioned people, it's probably happened two or three times in 20 years, if that, you know, you may want to contact that person, contact a neighbor that knows that person. It could be a medical issue. So one of my concerns was if there was a process or protocol regarding looking into extended absenteeism, um, that that facet somehow be brought into it. But basically, we just want to get a sense of town meeting if this is something that you'd like the town moderator and or any other uh, vehicle he deems fit to look into this and report back. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. O'Connor. James O'Connor, Precinct 19, your assistant moderator and a member of the Town Meeting Procedures Committee. It's been brought to our attention in the past that towards the break, before we had these electronic clickers and people could see who was here and who was not, that the number of people dwindled down. Perhaps that's one of the reasons we were asked to address the issue of the time limits on speaking because people wanted an efficient meeting. Um, I know we have another article after this, so it's more than likely that we won't conclude tonight, as some people had hoped we did. But when the Town Meeting Procedures Committee spoke together, we talked about asking the town meeting, as we did last year, we had a resolution, and the moderator asked a question whether people would consider a shorter time limit for minutes. What we'd like to do is just to investigate, because some towns have a procedure by which if there's an absence of more than 25% of the time, that the member of the meeting that isn't there be considered vacating their office or abandoning it. We're not asking people to make a decision tonight. What we're asking people is to recommend by resolution that we consider the matter as several people have asked about it, the purpose of which is to determine why do we have 30 people that last year didn't attend more than 50% of the meetings? Well, one of the questions we might ask when we're talking about democracy is if the voter speaks and the voter votes a person in, regardless of their absences, should they be allowed to continue? Well, maybe they watch at home. The one thing they don't have is a clicker. You know, they can't use it from home, so we don't get their vote. Doesn't represent that precinct. What we would like to do is have an active, interested body, and I, for one, want to thank all of you for the most interesting budget discussions that I've had in the 17 years I've been part of town meeting. I thought that tonight there was a lot of really good discussion, and then the last couple nights about different articles. We're trying to encourage people to want to be here. So absence kind of indicates maybe people don't want to be here. I have to honestly tell you, I'm the chair of Precinct 19, and a few years ago, one of the members of my precinct came to me and he said, I can't be on it anymore. I'm not going to be able to be present. But I'd like to appoint Joel. He's my neighbor across the street. I said, that isn't the process. The process is that you bring it to the attention of the town clerk, she posts the vacancy, and it's brought up on a vote at the next town election. If that is during town meeting that somebody decides to resign for medical purposes or otherwise, then it's certainly possible that the precincts get together at a special meeting with a quorum and appoint somebody to fill the term. But what we really are looking for is a mood of the meeting to determine, do we want to? as other towns, such as Framingham, 
um, Reading and others that we looked into. Do we want to ask people, do they want to be here? We're not going to kick them out unless it's the recommendation and the decision next year subsequent to investigation with a bylaw that asks them to just give us some idea of their intention. So that's why this is on the warrant and we ask for your support. I believe that uh, there may be some other people that have some thoughts about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Mr. Sean Harrington. Sean Harrington, uh, Precinct 15. Um, so I'm going to mention it because we all know that there was a member uh, who was a member of town meeting but didn't show up for, I think it was five years. Um, do we know the status of that member, Mr. Moderator? Are they still a member of town meeting? There was one member who didn't show up for nearly 10 years who did resign this year. All right, so he wasn't here for 10 years. 10 years. We. Wow. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and I don't mean to pick them out and you know point at them, but um, my first thought on this is to be you know, if, you know, if we could just ask them to resign or simply say, look, if you're not going to be here, could you potentially vacate the seat? That seemed to kind of work once they were asked or nudged or at least publicly shown that they haven't shown up for, I thought it was only five years. Um, I was just curious, not to try to drag this along, but do you guys have any thought, uh, does the uh, committee looking at this or that plans on investigating this have any thoughts on potential procedures already? Like, I don't need to hear what those procedures are. I'm just curious if they have any thoughts already or if they've been starting to talk about it. No, there's no th thoughts. It's just investigation as to other towns how it's okay. done. Well, that's all I wanted to know. Um, the only thing I would recommend is that uh, to the committee is that if we end up voting for this, that they not allow it to be a vote of town meeting, but of the precincts, and have it specifically be the members of the precinct that vote to remove uh, the member that is not showing up. I'd re I think that that would be more appropriate. Oh, yeah, enough, with the, enough with the hand waving in the back, okay? But anyways, <laughs> um, the reason why I'd say that is because their member of their precinct should be up to the people represented who are also representing that precinct to remove them, not the whole body. You're, no offense, but your precincts didn't vote for them. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. Mr. Tully? Oh, I thought Joe had his happy did. Joe Tully, Precinct 14. I know everybody's eager to get out of here. Um, I also thank the moderator for the job he does as a moderator and also for his, uh, for his participation on the procedures committee as well as the other members of the procedures committee. And I understand that tonight's vote is merely to decide whether we want to move forward with exploring our options. But it seems to me that it's a little bit like letting the camel's nose under the tent. So if you're like me, please vote no tonight so that we don't have to go any further with it. The principle behind this in my opinion, seems a bit sanctimonious, and I think the penalty of expelling fellow town meeting members seems a little bit draconian. Clearly, there are some members that don't have an adequate attendance record, but does that, does that poor attendance record from a small handful of members really affect our finished product? This is my 22nd town meeting, and I can't recall a time when we've ever been close to not having a quorum. A few times during this meeting, we've heard the term solution looking for a problem, in this case, we have a problem for which a solution already exists. It may be blunt and sobering to say so, but those who are elected to serve here owe us no duty, not even a duty of attendance. Their duty is to the people of their respective precincts, and it's really up to the voters of those precincts to determine whether they're satisfied with their own members' performance. Further, keep in mind that attendance doesn't mean that anybody is necessarily participating in the meeting in any significant way, or even paying attention for that matter. In fact, one doesn't even need to be present for the meeting to be credited with attendance. All you have to do is check in at the beginning of the meeting and you're credited with attendance regardless of how long you stick around. And of course, there's also the existential irony of coercing attendance only to routinely terminate debate before everyone has had a chance to participate. I suppose I'd feel differently if people were clamoring to fill these seats, but year after year we have uncontested races and even seats that go entirely vacant. 
Now, I'm generally from the crowd of people that uh, never has seen a problem that can't be solved by government intervention or overreach. But in this case, I think we need perhaps more of a free market solution. What we ought to do is determine why so few people find serving in town meeting to be unattractive. When we solve that problem, then the attendance problem will solve itself. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Swilling. Nathan Swilling, Precinct 4, move to terminate debate on all matters related to this article. Motion to terminate debate on all matters. Um, it's been seconded. All in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, we have the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen in front of us. All in favor, please, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Uh, the chair is unsur unsure. Let's use the clickers. No, there's no substitute. Yes, sir. Is there a substitute or is it just the main motion? There's just the main motion. Thank you. Yep. Okay, we have for us a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen to set up, ask the town meeting committee, procedure committee to investigate the issue. If you want them to go do so, please vote one, yes, or two, no, if you do not. And he's ready, so please vote one, yes, two, no. Is 107 in the affirmative, 79 in the negative. It is an affirmative vote, and I so declare. That terminates Article 45 and brings us to Article 46. I have a motion to, motion to adjourn. Um, all in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Okay, I believe that is a failed article to adjourn. Mr. McKinney, what purpose do you have your hand up? Oh, okay, well, I haven't even got there yet. So, we have before us um, article, shh, article 46, Resolution for the Master Plan Endorsement. Um, we have the recommended vote of the Redevelopment Board to endorse their plan. Um, goes on and on. Someone want to pre present it? I think we have slides right now. Good evening, Andrew Bunnell, Chair of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Uh, before I get into my presentation, I want to briefly thank the board themselves, the staff that's participated in this over the years, and the, uh, the MPAC, who was very highly involved in getting this together. The Arlington Master Plan is the result of more than two years of work by residents, volunteers, business owners, and town staff to create a comprehensive action agenda for Speak future right land the use microphone, sir. and physical development in Arlington. From the beginning of the process, the Arlington Redevelopment Board and the Master Plan Advisory Committee expressed their intent to also seek town meeting endorsement of the Arlington Master Plan out of respect for the many action steps that will require future town meeting consideration. Tonight, we ask for your endorsement of the adopted Master Plan. In addition to the full copies of the plan distributed to town meeting members uh, throughout town meeting, a summary of the master plan was sent back in March to all town meeting members and to candidates for town meeting. The adopted Arlington master plan was posted on the town's website back on March 16th. Copies are also available to be borrowed from both the Fox and Robbins Library. Four information sessions were given uh, for town me meeting members on Article 46 and the Arlington master plan in March and April, and we thank all of you who attended those sessions. 
The Arlington Master Plan addresses seven different but interrelated elements. Land use, transportation, housing, economic development, natural resources and open space, historic and cultural resource areas, and public facilities and services. The Master Plan is a coordinated community agenda for future land use and development in Arlington. The Arlington Master Plan's action steps address the community's expressed desire to maintain fiscal stability while continuing to provide public services and facilities, to upgrade schools, expand the commercial industrial tax base, protect the environment and our historic buildings and landmarks, improve mobility, and expand housing choices and affordability. More than 140 public gatherings, surveys, news articles, town notices, television programs and meetings went into the public process for this plan. In addition, the Master Plan Advisory Committee met more than 25 times to guide this process. And after a public hearing and public comment on the drafts, the Arlington Master Plan was adopted by the Arlington Redevelopment Board through its Planning Board Authority on February 4th, 2015 in accordance with Mass General Law. The Board of Selectmen then voted March 9th to recommend favorable action on this article. Much of the implementation process for the Arlington Master Plan will require returning regularly here to town meeting and will require town meeting's approval of any budgetary or zoning matters, just as they do now. Endorsement of the Arlington Master Plan signals town meeting support of the overriding vision and countless efforts to which hundreds of residents, businesses, and volunteers contributed and shows town meeting's willingness to consider policy solutions at upcoming town meetings. The Arlington Master Plan is not a zoning bylaw change. It is not a capital improvement program. It is not a budget or any regulatory document. It simply provides the framework for the development of these plan implementation tools. Later this year, a master plan implementation committee will be formed to coordinate, schedule, manage, track and report process on implementing the Arlington Master Plan's 94 action items. Those are found in the implementation table included in chapter nine of the master plan. A town meeting member will be appointed to the implementation committee. Town meeting members have asked whether a yes vote to endorse binds town meeting to future yes votes to implement specific recommendations in the plan. The answer to that is no. Town meeting members have also asked what happens if town meeting fails to endorse the Arlington Master Plan. Arlington will still have the benefits of having adopted a master plan, but it would be a missed opportunity because with town meeting support, we send the strongest message to state, to the grant makers, to investors, businesses, and property owners and developers on what this community values and what this community envisions for itself over the next 20 years. Arlington is and will be stronger with a united planning policy going forward. With a yes vote on this article, we ask the town meeting endorse the action of the redevelopment board in adopting the plan, the town meeting consider the Arlington master plan to be a living document to guide future action, being subject to regular review and updates and conditions warrant, and we ask that town meeting look forward to active participation and consideration of future actions to be taken while continuing the open process and ongoing public participation as implementation of the Arlington Master Plan proceeds. We thank you very much for your consideration and hope you will vote to endorse the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. I got to turn my light on. Mr. Rearig. Really? Have another copy? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Brian Rearig, uh, Precinct 8. And I rise in support of the master plan and observe that the master plan calls for the permanent protection of the Mugar site. Some town meeting members have fought for that objective for decades. Others may be entirely new to the issue and wonder why it's seen as so important or why this is coming up right now. Well, it's back in the news because of the latest proposal to develop the parcel contrary to decades of Arlington public policy. And it matters because the parcel's condition affects our public safety 
and property values, for better or worse, by affecting the severity of flooding in surrounding and downstream neighborhoods. Eve, if you would. The 17-acre Mugar site is bounded by Route 2, Thorndike Field, and the backyards of Mott, Little John, Parker, Dorothy, Birch, Edith, and Margaret Streets. It's a remnant of the great swamp of Alewife Brook, which once handled tide waters naturally. With increasing development and increasing rainfalls, our neighborhoods, streets, and roadways are threatened with more frequent and more severe flooding. You'll see some reminders here of the flooding of 1996, 98, 2001, 2004, and 2010. And there's worse to come for three reasons. First, continuing overdevelopment nearby continues to squeeze any remaining resiliency out of the watershed and increase its vulnerability to flooding. Second, the combined sewer overflow project, separation project underway in Cambridge will at last prevent raw sewage from being diverted into Alewife Brook, but also means that stormwater formerly sent illegally to Deer Island is now kept in the watershed. And finally, the effects of climate change cause extremes of storm events to get bigger. Already, the old rules don't apply. Since 1996, we've had a 10-year storm, three 25-year storms, and a 50-year storm, all in a span of 15 years. Why? Because the definitions of those storms are based on 60-year-old regional rainfall statistics. Updated data by the National Center at Cornell shows much higher local storm event extremes are already the norm. Now, what does this have to do with the Mugar parcel? As development steals resilience from a watershed, so wetlands add to the resilience of the watershed. The Mugar site is locally one of the lowest lying areas, and in its natural state was substantially tidal wetlands. The site still contains significant wetland areas and still functions as a buffer for our neighborhoods, despite having been grossly degraded over the years. Its owners allowed the state to use it as a dumping ground for fill from the widening of Route 2, and later the construction of Alewife Station. Perversely, they now want to pat on the back for proposing to clean it up by paving it over. Adding acres of impervious surface will make matters worse, and perhaps more importantly, will remove the potential that the site offers for greater protection of our neighborhoods, if restored to nearer its natural state. The Army Corps of Engineers set out to evaluate that potential in 2002, when it proposed including the Mugar parcel in a study of potential restoration of degraded wetlands. The project proposal went unfunded, but consider what some of the Corps had to say about potential restoration sites like Mugar. I quote, industrial development and floodplain encroachment have resulted in the elimination or reduction of freshwater wetland areas along many of Massachusetts rivers. Wetlands provide areas for groundwater and, pro in, and can improve water quality by filtering pollutants and provide natural flood attenuation by storing floodwaters. The current proposal, which would pave over or disturb half the site, relies on the hammer of the state Chapter 40B statute, which in exchange for providing a bit more affordable housing than Arlington's inclusionary zoning bylaw would require, gives the developer leverage to ignore or leapfrog over local bylaws and local concerns. I've heard it suggested that the town, under this threat, should negotiate with the would-be developer to reduce the size of the project from the current 219 units and 300 parking spaces. I say no thank you. The town of Arlington has a strong basis on which to oppose issuance of a 40B comprehensive permit for this site. That basis is a clearly articulated and consistent public planning and policy history calling for the protection of the site based on a significant local need. This is a factor that can and will be considered by the State Permit Review Authority. It is to reinforce Arlington's consistent voice on this issue, reiterating its open space plan and previous town meeting actions, that we highlight the master plan's call for preservation and bring town meeting attention to it in this resolution. Uh, what's the eventual goal here? There's a 65-year trail of failed development proposals for this site. My own hope is that it finally becomes clear to the owners when this latest proposal fails, that the site is substantially unbuildable, commercially virtually a white elephant, and that it's past time to engage with the town, the state, nonprofit conservation partners, and FEMA, which has available hazard mitigation funding for acquisition and restoration, and bring to a future town meeting 
a deal that lets them recover some of their unfortunate investment while protecting the true value of the site as conservation land. Going on. I'd like you to look again at this clip we saw a few minutes ago. This is a line of mass highway trucks trying to clear Route 2 of flood water by pumping it away. And to where? Onto the Mugar parcel. Imagine if that were paved over. And going on again. Dorothy Road residents will recognize their houses in this next image beyond the Mugar parcel in this 1951 photo showing the land in its natural state as a marsh and captioned by a town employee who was clearly given to understatement. The low land is wet, he wrote. 64 years later, it is still wet. And despite being, despite being abused, it adds resilience to our neighborhoods and offers the potential, if preserved and restored, of greater benefit to the community. Please continue to support Arlington's clearly articulated goal of preserving this site by endorsing both the amendment and the master plan itself. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. You get a second on your motion? Second. Second, thank you. Mr. Um, Harrington? Got one. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13, different view. Um, I've come here to actually support what Brian says, but I think that you've got to take it a little step further. So one of the reasons the CPA was passed was preservation of open land space and new guys open space. And my amendment just calls for further the resolution that we use the CPA funds preferentially to purchase the land and ask the town manager to enter negotiations post haste. And the reason that I bring this up is because um, a bunch of reasons. Wishing and hoping that something's gonna happen may mean it doesn't happen. If you take action, you have a much stronger possibility of it happening. And what is it? Turn the Muga into open space by buying it. Now, we all like to say, oh, well, I hope the developer realizes that it's not developable land. It's been taxed and marked as developable land for the past 20, 30 years, to the cost of about a million dollars to the Mugas. And so we can say it's not developable, but that's not how we've been telling them for 30 years. And you go in front of any reasonable person, and they're going to say, well, Arlington, look at it. You've been saying it's developable, and now you're saying it's not. In addition, if you say, oh, well, maybe they won't do it by right, I think that you're going to find that, that you know, the Civil Maple Forest will give you a lot of example of where a developer can use a 40B to ignore it, to ignore the zoning in Arlington, to ignore town meeting resolution. And so all my amendment calls for add to the resolution that you want the CPA monies, the CPA funds, to be preferentially used to purchase the property. It's fair to the developer. It guarantees a higher chance of success. And um, I think it's actually better all around for everyone. Now, of course, you know, the 30% that's already earmarked on CPA funds, that's not what I'm talking about. It can be a small amount. You can bond it. You could purchase that land and bond it and pay off the CPA bond over a long period of time. It's fair to the Mugas. A lot of things, you know, every time I've heard Muga in context of this, you know, you could maybe put in, you know, Genghis Khan. Um, the Mugas are actually a wonderful family, very philanthropic. They've done a lot of good for the state of Massachusetts. And I'm sure that they'd be happy to enter into negotiations where the one thing that we never hear about is Arlington actually paying for it. And so I ask you to support this amendment. Let's actually put our name on this. This is how the CPA was partially passed to purchase open space. Let's use our CPA to purchase the property. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That's seconded.
We have a motion for what? Motion to oh, it's a motion to adjourn. All of, it's, an, it's, an, it's a motion to adjourn is a um, privileged motion. It can be made at any time. All in favor, we have a motion to adjourn. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. Okay, we're going to stay, I guess, till this is done. So, for the motion to adjourn? We don't need to. Um, Ms. Fitzgerald? Ann Fitzgerald? Huh? My name is Ann Fitzgerald, Precinct 17 Town Meeting Member and League of Women Voters Arlington Liaison to the Coalition to Save Our Wetlands. The Board of the League of Women Voters of Arlington voted unanimously to support Brian Rarig's amendment to Article 46. The League has a solid local positions under conservation and recreation the acquisition and retention of land and water for conservation, and the preservation, maintenance, and beautification of existing open space. The League urges you to support this amendment to, pre to preserve the Mugau land as open space for the future of all Allentonians. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Mr. McKinney. Lawrence McKinney, Precinct 7. Um, as an aside, I might add that as a young camper, uh, Stephen Mugar taught me how to use a camera. Um, he was a, a camp counselor once, and I can only tell you how small I was because I thought Mr. Mugar was tall and skinny. Okay, the reason I'm standing up here is because I believe in this town and its historic and its famous uh, colonial uh, byway association and the amount of time that this plan seems to put for the importance of expanding the knowledge of our town for investment purposes for just about any good reason for people to know about our town. And as you know, I am the typical, you know, I only have one, 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 one shtick here, which is um, there is only one person that everyone knows about that came out of Arlington. We have to, we've never, never going to be able to tell the world about the Schwamm Mill, as wonderful as it is. We're never going to be able to do it with any of our other things because, you know, they're not that well known. Uncle Sam is. And what we have done in the last five years is to prove to everybody that Uncle Sam is not a cartoon character. Scope. 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 Okay, well, I'm standing here. We're talking here, about the I'm master here plan, not one, Uncle Sam. It is not, it, our most famous guy is not mentioned once. And I'm going to ask Ms. Kowalski, are there any provisions whatsoever uh, Mr. that we can L add Mr. Uncle Sam Mr. to this McKinney, document? Yep. You had a, two years to ask her about Uncle Sam in the master plan. All right, with all Adam, due, Mr. Chapdelaine is going to tell you about Uncle Sam. With all due Sam. respect, but we had two I brought years, this sir. question to the consultants. Two years, two years ago. Mr. Chaplain is going to tell you your answer. Adam Chaplain, town manager. Uncle Sam, the statue, and the park are mentioned on pages 41, 115, and 120 of the master plan document. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chaplain. That should be about it, huh, Mr. I McKinney? stand corrected. Very good. Now sit down. Mr. Ruderman. Thank you, sir. Well, I guess he just cut you right off. Mr. Ward and Mr. Ruderman was up. Oh, sorry. Yep. <laughs> Mr. Ruderman? Neither is mine, sir. Uh, Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. Uh, the hour is late. I follow a very slick presentation. I'm sorry I didn't have time to put together the graphics. I'm speaking against the amendment. I'm speaking against the resolution of the master plan. I ask your indulgence for about five minutes. I know the hour is late, but you voted that you didn't want to adjourn yet. So please hear me out. Get to 
with all sympathy to the horrors of flooding, repeated flooding, house ruining flooding. It appears that certain areas of East Arlington flood very well on their own without developing the Mugar parcel. Has anyone considered the possibility that developing the parcel might just include a plan developed by hydrologists for drainage that might um, ameliorate some of the likelihood of flooding. It is presumed and it has been put forth, it has been expounded from this podium, from public venues all across this town that nothing good can come from developing that parcel. And you are asked to sit here at a very late hour and simply believe that with no one to speak to the contrary. I will speak to the contrary. Perhaps something good could come from developing that parcel. Second point, every time you hear someone say, save our wetlands, stop. The middle word, our, wrong. They're not ours. They're someone else's private property. We can make them ours. We could restrict them until they had no use. We could downzone the property to something that we say we could live with. I am certain that the owners would contest that in court. We could take the property by eminent domain. We could offer them a sum of money. They would have a statutory three years to decide if they would accept that sum of money or come into court and sue us. I propose to you it would not take them three years to decide that it was an insufficient sum of money, no matter what we voted. Because whatever the value of the land was last year, it's not that anymore. It's not what they were being assessed for. It's not what they've been paying the taxes on it for generations as developable land. Now it's the value of the land as the return on the, as the, it, now it is the return on the investment that they are ready, willing, and able to make at this point. It's not what the land is worth. It's what the profit of their project is worth. That's what we'd have to pay for it. That's what Mr. Rarig's amendment basically puts us on the hook for. That's what Mr. Harrington's resolution to devote a large chunk of the Community Preservation Act funds puts us on the hook for. Do not be confused. Every time we vote for something, we set precedent for something else. How many votes were put in front of us in the entire saga of the redevelopment of the Sims Hospital site? Oh, this is just to move the process along. Oh, this is just to enable the next step. This is just to hire the next people. This is just to consider, this is, I don't know how many times we were told this is just, but we got exactly what we would have gotten in the end. We got a residential development as densely as they could build it, about a half an acre of public land <laughs> No medical use, no public amenities, but every vote was just another step in the process. They used to call the Sears catalog, you know, like a city phone book, the wish list for kids for Christmas presents. There's more wishing in this master plan than there is in the Sears catalog. And the fault with a master plan is not that it wasn't the product of hard work. It was the product of hard work. The fault in the master plan is not that there were dozens, literally dozens of public meetings. There were. The fault in the master plan is not that good people brought lots of people in from the public, that good consultants spent our money in good efforts. That's not the fault in the master plan. The fault in the master plan is that you never see dollars and cents mentioned. There are no choices in the master plan. It exists as if every budget item was an island and every one of them could be indiv individually posited to you as a good thing. And yes, they are all good things, but no budget decision is ever made in a vacuum. Every budget decision contests against every other budget decision and with the zero option of maybe we should just do nothing. Maybe this isn't worth spending our money on. Every solution in the master plan for the business and real estate and land use sections is more development. I could quote you the sections, it'll take too long. Build higher, 
cover more area, zone properties up, reduce the number of parking spaces that developments require. It's all in there. All you have to do is read the first 30 pages. It's all in the summaries. And now we have before us an amendment that not only takes all of these very expensive wishes and puts one more in, one more that would take 30 years to pay for. This is exactly why I opposed the Community Preserva Preservation Act adoption in this town, because the Community Preservation Committee would have the ability to propose to this meeting a project which would take 30 years to pay off. Is there no sense in this meeting that in the next two or three or five or 30 years, we might have something else to do with I don't know how many million dollars, do you? Does anyone? And yet we're being asked to vote to underline that part of the wish list above everything else. Make sure we buy the Mugar property because that's the only way it does become our wetlands. 30 seconds. This may be the last time I speak to town meeting. I urge you, do not spend future money that would be better off in other places. Thank you, sir. Mr. Michaelman. Tom Michaelman, Precinct 7. Um, I have a question, Mr. Moderator. Um, sir. Mr. Harrington's amendment. Um, if it, it passes, does that mean it's mandatory that we spend Community Preservation Act money to purchase the Mugar property? Or does it mean it's just a recommendation of town meeting that the Community Preservation Committee um, vote to spend Ms. money purchasing Mr. the Mugar property? Town Council Doug Heim is going to address that issue. Town Council, uh, Doug Heim, uh, it at most would be a recommendation. You can't, as a vote of town meeting, bind the Community Preservation Committee to expend money in one way or another with the resolution of town meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Ward, now is your chance. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm sorry I uh, misunderstood you uh, before. Uh, John Ward in Precinct 8. Uh, well, um, I can't uh, possibly match the brilliance or fervor of the oratory of the speaker just before the gentleman who asked the question. Um, so I shan't try to. I haven't done that for a long time. Um, the, um, I, um, I have to agree, I think, with Mr. Harrington's uh, amendment. One of the reasons that I supported the Community Preservation Act uh, is I, I'm on the public record, if anybody still reads The Advocate, uh, that, um, uh, that one of the, uh, a single justifying reason for passing it would be to enable us uh, to obtain the funds to perhaps uh, purchase uh, that property, which the town has been pointed out has been uh, a goal of the town for a long time and was very nearly achieved a few years ago with the negotiation fell apart for some reason that is not, uh, it's not known to me anyway. Um, so that is, the, 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 that, that is something we, 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 we really, um, we, I think we, we really ought to do and uh, uh, obviously then I would support Mr. Rarig's uh, 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 motion that um, uh, emphasizes the provisions the language in the master plan that says that this is a, uh, a a real priority and of course it was forced upon us by the um by the mugars uh, people coming in and filing this 40b application which, uh, which had, has a good deal of irony about it because the zoning the pud zoning on the mugar parcel uh is there at the instance of the mugar family that brought it before this meeting in 1970. Uh, it's the only PUD zone in town. 
and, and, and they wanted it. And now, now they say, now we, well, we, we decided we don't, we don't like the zoning we asked you to pass. We want to trump all your crummy zoning and go for 40B. Um, that's, uh, I think that's not, not really play, playing fair in my book. Um, but the, I really didn't come to speak about, about that particular issue, but about the master plan uh, in, in, in general. There's a lot of uh, good ideas in it. There's some, um, uh, some residents with the thoughts that I, that's been a, I was in a lot of those uh, public meetings that uh, were talked about, and, uh, and I, I uh, contributed a few ideas, and some of which made them into the big book here. Um, but there is a problem that afflicts this town. Uh, it's like the elephant in the parlor that is just barely mentioned. But if you look on page 186, item 21, uh, it deals with it in a kind of soft pedal way. The problem is, now if, if, you, if you obviously live in an Arlington neighborhood, you're aware of this. Mega houses tear downs on small lots. Uh, taking away uh, many of those smaller homes that might be, as someone put it, semi-affordable for, for a young couple, um, or, or, or an elderly retired couple for that matter, um, and, and, and putting up some, some huge building that deprives one of uh, uh, sunlight and, and, uh, and is out of scale with the neighborhood and, and just uh, kind of overwhelming. There's one in my neighborhood recently. It's four stories off the ground. I, 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 don't know how they, I don't know how they compute this stuff, but from the ground to the top, it's four almost full stories. Uh, it's, it, I, I, it, if you just came into town, you'd say, oh, there's that little hotel we're looking for. Uh, but but it, I don't know, it doesn't have a sign on it yet, so, so I, I don't know what it's going to be. Uh, so, so anyway, I, I, uh, um, I, I, I bring that particularly to your attention because uh, I, I hope that the redevelopment board, it says this is a priority item that staff can do it, uh, will take uh, serious efforts to research what other towns have done to prevent this mansionization, or mcmansionization it really is, uh, and, and fix up our zoning laws so that neighborhoods can be protected uh, and be kept, as the, they, they said in the presentation, uh, not this one, but in a previous one, that our goal is to protect Arlington, keep Arlington's neighborhoods pretty much the way they are. Well, I think that's the way we would like to see them, and I hope they will work on that. Otherwise, and, and, and I, I encourage you to uh, vote for all the items that are before you. And, and it's, it's, but it's just in closing, say it, uh, this is the latest we've run town meeting uh, um, since before I was moderator, but uh, that's what you wanted to do, so have a nice night. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Kaplan? Bill, Bill Kaplan, Precinct 6. I, I'm not moving the question, sorry. We, people voted to stay. So uh, this is actually, the master plan is, is a, a major plan that spent years uh, to develop and had a lot of community input. Uh, the idea that we're just going to cram it in as we're all raring to go home is it's a bad idea. We, we should have adjourned and spent some actual time discussing this. Uh, and we still, the next person who raises his hand could still try to adjourn and we could come back and spend a half an hour or 45 minutes on Wednesday. Uh, but I'm just going to say that it, it, the master plan has it's got a lot of ideas. It's a big plan for the future. Some of the ideas are good ideas and some of the ideas are bad ideas. Um, I'm not sure that I can support it because even though there are things that I really like in there, there are things that I really don't like. Uh, I know the town meeting uh, voted a few years ago against changing the zoning to allow five-story multi-use uh, buildings in the town. Uh, we decided that's just too big. Well, that's in the master plan as something they want to do. So, I mean, it's a mix of uh, the Mugar property. Absolutely don't want that developed into a massive apartment complex. Um, so that's in there, that's good. So uh, I'm just making the point that it's a mix of good things and bad things. Uh, there's probably no one in this room who will like everything there. There's probably no one in this room who won't like anything there. So uh, to say we're back in this, it's a little odd because we're back in some of this. Each one of us is backing some of it and not back in other parts of it. Um, they're going forward with it, whether we, you know, whether we say yes, we're for it or not. The town's moving forward, so our opinion is really they just want to be able to say the town meeting supports this. 
they don't care whether we support it, they're doing it anyway. Um, so when you vote, just you know, decide for yourself, how much of this do I like, how much of this don't I like? Uh, do I want to be putting my stamp of approval on this massive document with a ton of ideas and, and a roadmap for the future? Uh, again, which some of it you'll like and some of it you won't. Um, that, that's all for me, thanks. Thank you, sir. Mr. Wagner, you are next. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. I motion to terminate debate on the article and all associated matters. Second. Motion to terminate debate on the article and all associated matters under there. They are under. It's been seconded. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. My opinion, it is a two-thirds vote. We have before us the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen, and we have Mr. Rarig's and Mr. Harrington's motion. Um, we'll vote on the uh, mo motions as they were presented to us. First, Mr. Rarig's, and then Mr. Harrington's, and then we'll vote on the, sir. He doesn't say it wasn't in order. I believe, if you want to reiterate what you said, Mr. Heim, we can't direct them what to do. It's only a resolution. Doug Heim, Town Council. It's an amendment to a resolution. I think while in some ways it might be a close question, what I think is ultimately needs to be highlighted is that a resolution of that nature can't dictate to a community preservation committee how they'll expend their funds, what they'll even recommend to town meeting. What it would be doing is basically expressing a sentiment of town meeting and within this larger resolution that's about the master plan and the uh, new guard development. Thank you. Very good, thank you, sir. So first we have Mr. Rearig's amendment. Mr. Um, Renault, are you ready? So if you want Mr. Rearig's amendment, Rearig's, Brian Rearig's amendment. Yeah, B. Rearig. Brian Rearig, that's what I'm saying. If you want Mr. Rearig's amendment, you'll Press one for yes and two for no. So, vote one for yes, two for no on Mr. Rearig's amendment. We have an affirmative vote, 123 in the affirmative, 43 in the negative. It is so amended. We now have before us Mr. Harrington's amendment. So soon as Mr. Renault's spooled up his machine, if you want to, Mr. Harrington's amendment, you will vote one for yes and two for no. It is defeated 114 in the negative and 62 in the affirmative. So it is defeated. Mr. Harrington's defeated. Mr. Rierig says one. Now we have the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen as amended by Mr. Harrington's, excuse me, Mr. Rierig's amendment. So if you wish to vote for the resolution as amended, please press one for yes and two for no. We have 136 in the affirmative, 41 in the negative. It is an affirmative vote, and I so declare it. That leaves no more articles on the table. All articles have been dealt with. Mr. Tosti. I move that Article 3 be taken from the table. We, all in favor of moving Article 3 from the table, please say yes. Yes. 
All opposed? Article 3 is now before us. I move yep. that this town meeting be dissolved. We have a motion to dissolve town meeting. All in favor of dissolving the 2015 annual town meeting, please say yes. yes. Opposed? It is so dissolved. Thank you very much. Good job. We'll see you next year. Yeah. Thank you. Please return your clickers.